Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Bart D. Ehrman, this video will go viral. I really enjoyed this so much, and I know you will too. A Christian apologist by the name of Jonathan McClatchy has been taking pot shots at Dr. Ehrman, trying to discredit him in some of his articles, saying, well, Dr. Ehrman's sloppy, or he's not really someone to fear as a Christian when it comes to contradictions in the biblical account. And we take a detailed analysis of this, pulling graphics up thanks to people like Stephen Nelson, and we pick apart this apologist arguments. We also parallel Apollonius of Tyana to Jesus and slavery. Did Jesus condone slavery? Also, Dr. Ehrman makes his remarks about mythicism. I know some of you guys take this stuff offensive, but I'm just learning. We are Myth Vision. Welcome back to Myth Vision Podcast. Your host, Derek Lambert. We have the infamous Dr. Bart D. Ehrman with us today. Welcome to Myth Vision Podcast, sir. Yeah, well, thanks. Uh, I didn't know I was infamous, but it's nice to see you. <laughs> to a specific crowd, you're infamous. So, um, Thank you for coming to Myth Vision. I'm so thankful to our donors who made this possible. Super duper awesome. You guys are amazing. I can't I can't thank you enough. I'm so glad to finally make this happen and to be able to meet you, Dr. Ehrman. So I'm going to introduce you, and then we'll start getting uh, into the juicy stuff. Dr. Bart D. Ehrman is the James A. Gray Distinguished Professor at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, right down the street from me. He came to UNC in 1988 after four years of teaching at Rutgers University. At UNC, he has served as both the Director of Graduate Studies and the Chair of Department Religious Studies. A graduate of Wheaton College, Illinois, Bart received both his Master's of Divinity and PhD from Princeton Theological Seminary, where in 1985, in his, he did his doctoral dissertation in 1985 and was awarded magna cum laude. Since then, he has published extensively in the fields of New Testament and early Christianity, having written and edited 26 books, numerous scholarly articles, and dozens of book reviews. Among his most recent books are... Greek English edition of the Apostolic Fathers for the Loeb, Harvard University Press. A scholarly monograph on the use of literary forgery in the early Christianity, Oxford Uni University Press, and four New York Times bestsellers, Misquoting Jesus, God's Problem, Jesus Interrupted, an account of scholarly views of the New Testament, and Forged, I recently finished that a month ago or so, it was really amazing, a study of the books of the New Testament that were not actually written by their alleged authors. Also, everyone right now, before we get into the juicy stuff, go down in the description, join his blog, fantastic stuff. He even has guest articles from other scholars who come on. I love the one recently wondering if Paul was writing to a sister or had a sister trying to find out. Stuff. There's so much stuff. Anyway, and, and for the Great Courses Plus, where Dr. Ehrman teaches a, num a number of courses, make sure you guys check that out. So Dr. Ehrman, that was a lot of uh, just trying to get through the beginning because we have very limited time here. Um, here are some of our donor questions. We'll start with them. And first, we'll just call him Anonymous. Anonymous does not want his name uh, to be mentioned. But he asks, can you briefly talk about the parallels, if any, between Jesus and a contemporary Greek miracle worker, Apollonius of Tyana? Was there any borrowing between the narratives and who borrowed from who, if there was? Uh, yeah, it's a great it's a great question. So um, the, the background of the question behind the question is the fact that we have stories of other people besides Jesus who are uh, portrayed as miracle working sons of God, um, who often are born because of some miracle, some supernatural event, who are um, wunderkind <laughs> children who are like religious superstars and who um, grow up and then uh, go on itinerant preaching ministries and can heal the sick and cast out demons and raise the dead. And at the end of their life, they ascend to heaven. <laughs> so, <laughs> ha, sounds like Jesus. So, um, one of the uh, better known people in recent times has been uh, this figure, Apollonius of Tiana. Apollonius was not a contemporary of Jesus. He lived at the end of the first century instead of the first in the beginning of the first century. But he also had a miraculous birth where a, uh, a god uh, made a woman pregnant and he was born, who was a uh, religious genius as a child who, uh, when he grew up, went on a uh, preaching ministry, 
teaching people that they shouldn't be concerned about the material things of life. They should be concerned about the spiritual realm. Um, who could um, who could heal the sick and uh, make the weather do what they wanted it to do, and so on. And they and raise the dead. And at the end of his life, he was brought up on charges before the Roman authorities, uh, and um, and and he he ascended to heaven, <laughs> where he still is. <laughs> and so. Uh, so that's uh, so that's Apollonius of Tiana. Now, when you tell it in those general terms, it sounds just like Jesus. If you actually read the stories, it's not just like Jesus. <laughs> it's very different from Jesus in a lot of ways, lots of ways. For one thing, this guy is a neo-Pythagorean philosopher. <laughs> he's not a Jew, right. and he's so there are lots of differences. And the mother is actually not a virgin. It's just God gets her pregnant, but she's not a virgin. So. There are lots of differences, but there are lots of similarities. And so the question is, uh, why do you have these stories? And it's, as I said, it's not just Apollonius and Jesus. I mean, you have people like this. And so I think I think the reason is because in the ancient world, if you're talking about somebody that you think is a superhuman, like he's, he's human, but he's like he's not like the rest of us. Right. There are certain kinds of stories you tell about someone like that. And these are the kinds of stories about their their miraculous birth, their miraculous life, their miraculous afterlife. And so these are the things you say. And, and one of the things you say is that this person has become a divine being. And in the ancient world, the way you become a divine being is by going up to live in the divine realm. And so the, you have these stories of ascensions up to heaven. Um, so um, the, it's tricky because Apollonius lived after Jesus, but his, uh, his account, the accounts we have were written after the Gospels. So, like, you might think, you know, you're not sure who's borrowing from whom here, um, but um, so it, it doesn't look like the Gospels are borrowing from Apollonius, but uh, I'm not sure that Apollonius, is, the, the biographer of Apollonius is borrowing from him either. I think these are just stories that you find in the ancient world, and these two people are two of them. So technically, it was in the milieu, so to speak, in the air. Uh, there was a common practice for... Yeah things like this. Awesome. Next question, same donor. Uh, he asked if you could briefly speak about the writings of Aleutian of Samosota. And what I like about him is he's a second Socratic. So uh, this this is a guy who I guess we'd love him today, especially with the religious freedom we have. But uh, he, he's, he's arguing and writing funny, humorous stuff about superstitious people. And can you comment on that and just give us some elaborate on how yeah. this character was in the ancient world and how he affected Christians? So Lucian of Samosata was a um, he's a he's a skeptic and he's a satirist. So he writes satires. So if you've um, if you've ever read Voltaire, like the French satirist Candide, who who makes fun of religion by having religious people do stupid things, uh, Lucian of Samosata does that, and not just with religion but also with philosophy. Um, so we have a lot of his uh, works, and they are some of them are very amusing, um, and they they poke fun at people, uh, including religious figures, including uh, one figure who um, uh, his name is Peregrinus. Th this figure is Peregrinus, and he is a cynic philosopher who claims that nothing in this life really matters. The material world doesn't matter. Pleasure doesn't matter. The point is to escape this world and not to be bound by material wealth or material pleasure or anything. And he, he proves that he's really committed to his message by committing suicide, by throwing himself on a, a pyre built for the purpose at one of the Olympic Games in the second century. And Lucian observes this whole thing and thinks the guy's a real shyster, even though he's killed himself to do this. And, but it turns out in, in Lucian's account of him, he became a Christian for a while. And he, he duped the Christians uh, into thinking that he was uh, like uh, the, next, the second Jesus or something. <laughs> and so, uh, and so, so you get that. And then you get other people who are shysters, who just who do magic tricks that are sleights of hand and convince people that they're miracle workers and so on. <laughs> so Lucian's making fun of all that because he's, he's skeptical about everything like that. He's a terrific source for understanding um, early Christianity and for understanding some of the New Testament, uh, but it's also just really fun to read. So people who are interested in this kind of thing, Lucian of Samosata, it's great, great reading. Thank you, Dr. Herman. This is an interesting question. Do you think Morton Smith forged the secret gospel of Mark? 
Okay, so like this would take two hours to answer. Um, <laughs> we I got like know, two minutes. Yeah, well, see, I don't know what your reader, your listeners would know about the secret gospel. So Morton, I'll do it in two minutes. So uh, Morton Smith was a brilliant scholar who taught at Columbia University, one of the most brilliant scholars of early Christianity in modern times. Um, during the Second World War as a young man, he was uh, isolated in Israel. He was there checking out the archaeology and such and got stuck there during the war, couldn't get out because of the war. And he spent some time in a monastery called uh, Marsaba Monastery outside of Jerusalem about 12 miles out of Jerusalem. Um, he later, and he realized they have this really great library there, but there are no books that are, the books are in there, but there's no, no catalog of the books. Years later, he went back, uh, he had a research lead from Columbia, and he went back to catalog their books just so they'd know what's in there because there's old manuscripts and books. And he's going through a book, um, a particular book written in the 17th century that's the writing of one of the church fathers. It has some blank pages at the back. And inside the blank pages, is a handwritten, four pages of handwriting that um, looks like it's written sometime in the 18th century. He can judge from the, he's a Greek scholar and he um, thinks it's an 18th century hand. He doesn't have time to do it because he's trying to catalog all these books during his leave. So he just takes photographs of it. When he goes back after his leave and he reads, looks at these photographs, he realizes this claims to be a letter written by a famous church father, Clement of Alexandria, who lived around the year 200 who claims that he knew of a different edition of the Gospel of Mark, a secret Gospel of Mark that was kept secret. And this secret Gospel of Mark, among other things, has an episode in which a young man comes to Jesus during his ministry wearing nothing but a linen cloth over his nakedness. Mm. And Jesus spends, baptizes him and spends the night with him, teaching him the mysteries of the kingdom of God. <laughs> <laughs> they're and teaching Smith, the mysteries all right Smith, yeah, yeah miss things, Smith thinks there's more than some kind of spiritual mysteries going on here and that it's a homoerotic scene and so he wrote two books about it one a very scholarly book that's a imp very very impressive on Clement of Alexandria and the secret gospel of Mark and the other is a popular book just called I think it's just called the secret gospel of Mark scholars Scholars verified that um, these photographs are authentic. They verified that the handwriting is, in fact, from the 18th century. They verified that the style of the of the letter would it would be looks like it is a copy of Clement of Alexandria's writings because it's very much like Clement's writings, and the quotations from the Secret Mark sound a lot like our Gospel of Mark. Hmm. And there are a number of people who think that Morton Smith forged it. Right. And so um, the question is, what do I think? I What's tend to think, I tend to think he forged it. Okay. But it's a minority. It's a minority opinion within scholarship. I think the majority of scholars think that it's authentic. Well, um, but <laughs> I think I think he forged it. I think he probably. I'm not definite about it. Like I'm not right. going to. Like, it's not going to be my. You know, bet my house on it. But I. That's my guess. Thank you. Based, Dr. based on a long study of it. I appreciate it. What was the growth rate of Christianity during its earliest decades? I know you've written on this extensively, but uh, if you don't mind, just give a minute even uh, explaining that. And uh, we'll get into how many converts you think defected from the movement once the promises made by Jesus and Paul regarding the Messiah's return failed. But first, let's talk about the growth rate real quick. And then I have something interesting I want to poke in on that next one. So in my book on Triumph of Christianity, I try to estimate the growth rate of Christianity if it started out as the New, the New Testament says, that right after Jesus' death, there were 11 men, male disciples following him, and there was a handful of women with, him, with them in Jerusalem. So there are about 20 people to start, that's, and I think that's probably right, who, who first believed in the resurrection. By the year 300, there are probably two or three million Christians. Wow. And so people used to say, well, it must be a miracle. How do you get from 20 people to 3 million? <laughs> it's a miracle. Or people say there must have been like these massive evangelistic rallies where like, you know, like Billy Graham is down there and, you know, 5,000 convert on one day. How else are you going to get there? Um, so um, a sociologist of religion named Rodney Stark wrote a book called The Rise of Christianity. And, he sh and sociologists really know how to crunch demographics numbers. And so he crunched the numbers and said, you know, you don't need a miracle and you don't need massive conversions. What you need is a steady growth rate. And he estimated that if you grow from at a rate of about 40% a decade, 
you'd get there. So in my book on Triumph of Christianity, I discuss Stark's work and I show why there are problems with his numbers. And I recrunch the numbers and it's not significantly different. The growth rate over time would be about 35% growth rate. And what happens is it's an exponential curve. It's like if um, you invest money, you know, you're making 7% and you know, every year you're not making much, you're saving seven bucks for every hundred dollars. But if the hundred dollars is a million dollars, you're making money hand over fist at the same rate, right? So the money goes way up and that's how it is with population growth. So the entire period is about 35%, but it has to be much slower at the end and it has to be much faster at the beginning. Because if it's only, if it's only 35% a decade, uh, you know, then after uh, after ten years, those twenty people people have become you know twenty seven people. <laughs> There's clearly more than twenty seven Christians in the world. You know, and so when Paul writes the letter to Corinth in the fifties, you know there are more than forty Christians there, but forty Christians wow. in the Church of Corinth. And so so there's, it's much faster at the beginning and much slower at the end in order to make it work. What is the rate? I don't. Know. <laughs> it's a guess. A lot more. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you so much for that and. This is a technical question, I guess. I don't want to spend too much time because we've got some interesting apologist stuff we will get to, but I want to spend time on the donors' questions. And this one personally has my interest. How many converts do you think defected from the movement once the promises made by Jesus and Paul regarding the Messiah's return failed? And what were, because this is important to ask, and you do this in your, you lecture this all the time and say in your college courses, you ask people to show the difference between Paul's teachings and Jesus' teachings and stuff. So the real question comes down to, there's obviously a failed apocalyptic promise of some sort. What was Jesus's promise? And then Paul has a Messiah that's resurrected and has a returning Jesus. I very much doubt Jesus is on land going, all right, guys, I'm going to die and actually come back. So what promises did Jesus or the original movement in your best uh, educated guess would be on what he's saying? And then Paul's and how many people do you think defected when no return and no actual uh, parousia, if you will, occurred? So I think Jesus definitely did predict that a cosmic judge that he called the son of man was going to come back while his disciples were still alive. So within his generation, uh, Paul, um, who Paul probably converted three or four years after Jesus' death, and he expected Jesus to come back within his generation. He thought he would be alive. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 4, uh, 1, Thess 1 Corinthians 15, he, Jesus, Paul think, seems to think he's going to be alive when Jesus returns. It doesn't happen. So um, there's been some very interesting studies about what happens when you've got a religious group or some other kind of group that has a very firm expectation of something that is going to happen that doesn't happen. And um, if, if, you're, if, you're, if you read, your listeners want to listen, read something really cool about it. It's, uh, it's called uh, When Prophecy Fails by I Leon Festinger. Have you read it? I Fantastic. have it. I'm halfway through it right now. Oh, Fantastic. Gosh. Great. So it's about a UFO cult, as you know, who are expecting, you know, the Venetians or the Martians or somebody to come on this particular date to take them out of the world and the end doesn't come. And the, this, this author, who's a so, so, so social psychologist, has infiltrated the group to figure out what, what are they going to do. You would think what they would do is they'd give up and say, oh, we're wrong about that. <laughs> no, <laughs> some did. But the other thing that happened that's more striking is that the group became more evangelistic. They reset the date and try to get more converts. And Festinger has a psychological explanation for it. It has to do with a phenomenon that he, he named uh, cognitive dissonance. Cognitive dissonance is when you've got a belief that can be confirmed, that is confirmed. So there's dissonance between what you know is going to happen and what you know did happen. You thought you knew it was going to happen. What you do know did happen. There's a dissonance there. What happens? If you get more people to agree with you on this belief, it eases your feeling feeling bad that it didn't happen. It makes you think, oh, I was right. I just got the date wrong. You know, and so and so you go out and get more evangelistic. Christians appear to have gone out and gotten more evangelistic. <laughs> that makes sense. So some people certainly would have dropped from the movement, but we don't have any numbers. We we um, for any we we don't have numbers for defections at all throughout uh, 
Christian history. So we don't know. We just don't know. Interesting. And I suspect when the Gentiles find their way in, then that's when things actually are more successful. Paul, Paul, I think, kept the thing alive. I, I just very much doubt if it stuck. I, that's just my opinion. But anyway, I don't no, want to no. get trapped there. No, 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 no. I, no, I don't think if Paul hadn't come along, Paul didn't invent the idea that Jesus' death and resurrection is what brings salvation. Right. People get that wrong. They think Paul was the founder of Christianity. And that, that view was around before Paul converted. That's why he was persecuting Christians, because they're saying yeah. that. And he thought it was nonsense. But what his conversion was all about was realizing that this salvation to the Jews can go to Gentiles without them having to become Jews. Mm -hmm. And so men don't have to get circumcised. And so and Christianity is not following Jesus is not a Jewish sect for Paul. And so that opened up the floodgates. And, yeah, if that hadn't happened, Christianity would would not have anything like the success it's had. If we had more time, I would like probe you to ask you like specific details about Paula Fredrickson. Like, like I would love to get your insight because uh, it's just something of mine. But I suspect, uh, I don't know. I, 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 we'll save that for a future interview if everyone wants right. to hear your views on different scholarships of Paul within Judaism because I'm just fascinated. And your student, I believe one of your students, Dr. Jason Staples, uh, fingers crossed I can get him on to promote his new book that's coming out on uh, a new look on Israel. But uh, He will I'm, be happy to join you. I would. I would bet my house on that. <laughs> I hope so, because I want to learn from him. There's so many groups. And by the way, this whole second coming thing with cognitive dissonance, there's a group called uh, Full Preterist. Are you aware of them? Call, I'm sorry, called what? Full Preterist. Well, they I know what the Preterist that, view is, yeah. They, well, they're like full. They think that everything was fulfilled, the parasy, the second coming, resurrection, but they interpret yeah. it to mean, oh, that's covenantal language, or that's allegory. Well, that's not really cosmic. In Anyway, we, we've yeah. got to do more shows. So, ladies and gentlemen... Make sure you guys make that happen sometime. Anyway, next question, Dr. Ehrman. I'm I'm just excited to have you on here. Um, my really good friend, Anthony Guthrie, he, he helped made this possible with a substantial donation. And thank you, my friend. Here are his uh, questions. What do we know about the historical practice of slavery in the first century, especially the inheritance of foreign slaves who could be beaten to an extent without recourse? And I want to follow through with all that he has to say on this because you'll get the tone of what he's trying to ask. Yahweh, the author of the epistle of James and Jesus in the Gospels, all seem to intend for the old laws to be upheld forever, including those regarding slavery. When Jesus states in Matthew 5 that he came to fulfill the law and the prophets, how was this used to justify the transatlantic slave trade? And does it seem that the, the character of Jesus ever really envisioned a world without slavery? So he has, just like some of the guys I've been interviewing, the scholars, they point out that what slavery was, was actual slavery. A lot of fundamentalist Christians make it, oh, it's only indentured servitude. And they don't realize the cruelty in the Hebrew Bible or the, or even in the ancient Near East. Was Jesus upholding the same concepts of slavery? First question, I guess. It's a complicated question. It turns out not to be an easy one. Um, and one of the reasons it's complicated is because uh, slavery was a, a major institution throughout antiquity that virtually nobody questioned per se. Um, it wasn't seen as an ethical issue throughout in the Roman Empire. Um, the other reason it's complicated is because it wasn't like American slavery. American slavery um, had everything to do with race mm -hmm. and ancient slavery had nothing to do with race. Um, and it's true that foreign slaves could be beaten without, you know, without penalty, but any slave could be beaten without penalty. You, a slave was the property of their owner. Um, these were not indentured servants. Um, the word in Greek for slave that gets used in the New Testament is doulos. Um, it's the word that Paul uses uh, of himself, that he's a doulos of Christ. He's the slave of Christ, meaning Christ is his owner and Christ can do anything he wants with him. Mm -hmm. um, even though that was the case, slavery was a very complicated institution in antiquity because there were slaves on numerous levels. You had some slaves who were sent to the slave mine, to the salt mines. You know, their life expectancy would be about two years or something. It was like, it was, no, it was very bad, very bad, very bad. Um, uh, but there are other slaves who were um, welcome members of upper elite households who were highly educated scholars who um, 
or highly educated businessmen when business women and who were well placed and well treated and well dressed and well fed. And so it's not like there was a thing, slavery, there's this wide range of things, um, but it always involved um, somebody belonging to someone else, uh, not as an indentured servant, but actually being there, they're being owned by them um, for whatever purpose they wanted to use them for. Um, a large percentage of the population, I forget what the numbers are, but like a third of the population in Rome was slave, were slaves. Um, uh, it wasn't based on race. A lot of people, there were various ways to become enslaved. Um, if you were born into slavery, you yourself were, in other words, your parents were both slaves and you were born as a slave. Uh, a lot of slaves were provided by wars. And so prisoners of war would typically be made slaves. Um, uh, you could be sold into slavery if you if you owed uh, debt you weren't able to pay. You uh, could be you 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 were your own collateral <laughs> collateral. You would could become a slave. So there are all sorts of ways to becoming slaves. Uh, but again, it wasn't based on race or it was based on factors like that. The, the ones I've just mentioned. And I um, guess that oh sorry. I was just going to say Jesus did not oppose the institution of slavery. Either did Paul. Jesus. Um, but, you know, that doesn't seem weird. Nobody opposes the institution of slavery. I mean, we have, we have authors who are slaves. They don't oppose the institution of slavery. It's just the way things are. I mean, it's like, I mean, it's just, and so I, I don't know that it occurred to much of anybody. I mean, slaves do not want to be enslaved, and slaves could be set free, of course. I mean, an uh, owner could set free somebody that they thought well of or that they appreciated or that they were paid off or, you know, and so, so it was a fluid institution, but it definitely was slavery. Uh, and there were there was there were some nasty things that happened. Was it was also ask. though, you know, it turns out. Sorry, sorry but it turns out that in many ways, uh, in the ancient world, um, in many times and places, it was better to be a slave than to be a poor free person, hmm. because uh, the slave, at least, the the master has a reason for feeding the slave to make sure that they're uh, fed enough and healthy because this is their hired labor. <laughs> and if the person dies, they've lost an asset. The impoverished person doesn't have any backup plan. And so they're often seen as worse off than slaves. Interesting. I guess the final thing I'd like to say is, was this whole um, Matthew 5 with Jesus to fulfill the law and the prophets, was this just like a used verse or passage to justify transatlantic slave trade? Um, I mean, we know that like the Southern slave owners in America, for example, would use Bible verses sometimes to like, you know, use their, oh, well, slavery's thumbs up, you know. I don't know about Matthew 5 during the slave trade. It'd be, wor it'd be worth finding out. But it, Matthew 5 itself um, is a complicated passage. It's not so, but you're not asking what it really means. You're asking how was it used. Right, and right. I don't, I don't really, I don't know how it was used during the slave trade. It, I, it doesn't ring a bell as being the most common thing, though, because, you know, you have other things that would be more appropriate. Um, the one that was used a lot, for example, was the uh, the curse of Ham uh, in the Old Testament, where in the story of, of uh, Noah's three sons, um, who, uh, who one of whom, Ham, saw Noah uh, naked when he was stone drunk and and. Noah realized that he'd been shamed in front of his son and he cursed his son Canaan. And in the 19th century, as they develop uh, race theories, anthropologists developed race theories that you have these races and there some have some qualities, some have other. The thought came to be that the uh, what they called at the time the Negroid race came from uh, came from Ham, and that since it was that race was cursed, that meant that white folk were justified in enslaving black folk. Mm. Uh, and so that was a very common room, but Matthew five, I'm not aware of, but it just might be my ignorance. Well, thank you, Anthony, for those questions so much. Another donor says, I have a special request. Dr. Airman, please blink twice, twice. If you're secretly a mythicist, uh, <laughs> would you like to comment? Look, his eyes some, opened up even more. I'm going to get some toothpicks. <laughs> no, I think the mythicists are completely wrong. And, they, you know, 
And I think they're shooting themselves in the foot. Does everybody know what a mythicist is on your program? Yeah, everyone, yeah, pretty much. So, um, look, you're just doing yourself a disservice because people who are not mythicists are laughing at you. You're, you're ignoring historical evidence in order to assert a point. And you might think it's great, but it's like, you know, look, if you're a big fan of Fox News or of MSNBC, you think it's great. But anybody who's not, who listens to this, says this is just crazy. And to, look, I'm, I'm a fan of MSBC, I'm, but, you know, I, I, I'm a liberal. But, but you know, the evidence is so overwhelming. That I'm sorry, why, why, why not argue something that is going to make a difference instead of, like, trying? So I know why people do it. They like to get a name from themselves or they like to get a book published or they like having a following. And then it's cool to say Jesus never existed, but it's just bollocks to quote my English wife. <laughs> could, could we, and by any, by any chance before we leave this one to the next question, is it possible to say that some of the academic mythicists aren't on the same playing field as some of the guys who are, let's say, coming up with really, really, really out there theories that don't even – go into the vein of academia at all. Like for, for example, Dr. Richard Carrier, Dr. Robert McNair Price, would they be, you don't equate them to Holocaust deniers the same way you would someone else, right? Not generally. Cause I mean, those what, guys, yeah, they know a lot, but they know a lot, but they're completely wrong on this. Have you seen my debate with Robert? Yes. Price? Yes. So, yes. I mean, I just think they're completely wrong and Carrier, you know, Carrier's a smart enough fellow, um, but I think he does himself a disservice. He know he knows all. He's published, you know, he's got published, you know, a, an article or two in a peer-reviewed journal. He he brags about how many things he publishes in peer-reviewed journals, but I mean, it's not like a big deal. This is what scholars do. But you know, there's nobody there. There is no professor of New Testament in the world that I know of in a in an accredited university, and there are thousands of people like this who's a mythicist. I don't I don't know. Uh, do you know of one? I don't know of one. I am not aware. And that's not an accident. And it's not, you know, they say, well, they're prejudiced against us. Well, they're prejudiced against you for the same reason that the biology department is prejudiced against somebody who doesn't believe in evolution, but believes in Adam and Eve. They, they think you don't have any evidence. And so, but, you know, they get offended when I say that. I know they get offended, but I'm just telling you the reality is this is, this is the problem. So why not, why not like use your intelligence to, it, I don't know what your goal. I don't know what the goal is. I don't know what the goal is, but because um, right. I never really kind of asked them the goal. But if the goal is to to help to help people realize that Christianity is not true, you're not going to get there by saying things that people are just going to think are silly. You know, I I have to make a comment, and then we'll get to the next question. Is there's a group that thinks that all Paul's Gentiles are actually secretly lost Israelites, and so I'm like, and they go, well, this disproves Christianity. I'm like. You're never going to convince, first of all, with Greek and linguistics and experts. They all disagree with you. But number two is you think this is going to convince them? Anyway, there's so much more, Dr. Ehrman, that I can't even begin. We don't have the time. Uh, and if we if we thought we did, we'd be practicing cognitive dissonance. So <laughs> <laughs> we discover we had it. Yeah, right. <laughs> yes, sir. Textual criticism. This is uh, – <laughs> How do I say this? Apologist. We're going to be talking about this. So before I get into the key stuff, I'd like to cover, I just want to make sure our viewers get a very brief introduction to some of the basic of, uh, basics of textual criticism. Since a few of these topics are going to come up during our discussion, my friend, Stephen Nelson, you're the man, has put together some illustrations for all of the stuff we're going to be going over. And thanks for the illustrations, man. I'm going to pull up one that, that he made to start the conversation off which is an illustration of B.H. Streeter's theory of local text. And so let me pull this up real quick. I apologize. Do, do, do your listeners know what you're talking about? Uh, I don't think half of them will. Let me do okay. this. <laughs> Just wondered. <laughs> <laughs> so let me read this and then get your thoughts. Can you explain in broad terms what all, the, all this represents in, term, in terms text types and the transmission of the New Testament? And can you also explain what the coherence-based genealogy genealogical method is. I know you're going to love this. I know you're going to love this. No, and, I'm going to explain that. I'm telling you. Well, I'm going to try. I'm just trying. Just and, it. <laughs> and how it's changing the way textual critics conceive of text types and the role they play in reconstruction text. And by the way, you're going to hate me. Ready? 
Try to do it in less than five minutes. <laughs> yeah, right, okay. You know, so, okay. So I want you to explain quantum physics in five <laughs> minutes or less, please. And make it simple so everybody can understand, okay? Don't use any complicated language here. <laughs> I know, right? Okay. Um, so, okay. So is everybody seeing this chart? I think so. So B.H. Street, it was, um, so uh, early 20th century, a major scholar of the Gospels, Brit, um, he is building on the theory uh, developed most uh, convincingly by uh, uh, Westcott and Hort, who were two uh, Cambridge scholars uh, in the 1880s, who published their work in the 1880s. The logic of this chart is that you have different different forms of the New Testament in circulation in different parts of the Christian world in the early centuries. By different forms of the New Testament, I mean that scribes are copying the New Testament in Alexandria, Egypt, in North Africa, in the city of Caesarea. They're you know, different scribes in different places are copying the text. And in every place, scribes are making mistakes and they're sometimes changing things on purpose. The changes made in one place tend to stay in that place because that's where the other scribe, their successor scribes are copying them. And so a certain way, a certain form of the text, it's worded in a certain way. So you take John chapter one, there'll be differences in the way it's worded in Alexandria and in Caesarea and in Antioch in Italy, depending on the changes that scribes have made and then reproduced in that locale. The argument uh, of Streeter is that you can isolate these various local texts and that over time, as Christianity grew and spread, the textual traditions of one place came to affect the textual traditions of other places until by the end of the fourth century, you end up with a text that was kind of an amalgamated text of these various locations that is not particularly close to what the original looked like because it's an amalgamation of local texts in various places that have all been smashed together into one kind of more, one text that there is being seen as improved, but in fact has all sorts of changes in it because of where it came from. That's called the Byzantine text. That became the text of the Greek New Testament throughout the Middle Ages. And it is the form of the text that then was used as the basis for the King James translation. So that the King James translation is based on a form of the text that is a late and inferior form of the text to find out what the text looked like in the earlier centuries before the Byzantine text, you have to isolate the Alexandrian text and the Caesarean text and, the, and so forth and so on. So a quick question on that is, do we have, uh, or I might be wrong about this, do we, we don't have Jerome's Vulgate, do we? I think only later copies that are corrupt, corrupt correct? We don't have the original thing that Jerome did. And Jerome actually didn't do the entire Vul the Vulgate. He wrote, he did the Gospels, but... And so we don't have the originals of uh, the Greek New Testament or the originals of the Vulgate or the originals of translations, versions done in Syriac or Coptic or Armenian or none of these languages. So what we have in all of them are copies that have been made that have been changed either by mistake, by accident or on purpose. And the trick of textual criticism is to figure out among all these manuscripts which which reading of this verse is the right is the one that was originally written John 1 18 what was it a re, what did it originally said when the author wrote it and how was it changed and why was it changed that's what textual critics do and Streeter was a old old style textual critic it was very good at what he did he's not genealogical based <laughs> he is uh, genealogically based but oh, he's not he? he's not the coherence based genealogical method no, okay. he's genealogical. The whole thing is a genealogy because you're drawing a family tree. Okay, got and it. So you're drawing a genealogy, and so that's what that exactly is what he's doing. But that's not what the uh, <laughs> genealogical based coherent. I mean, yeah. I would hope that maybe we can have another time to do this. Of course, to delve into getting your thoughts on this theory. Of course, and and what, I know the coherence that based. Like, no, I'm telling you, the coherence based genealogical method is not something you're going to be able to explain in five minutes. I know. Yeah, maybe one day. That's what I'm saying. And nobody's going to care. <laughs> because well, modern, it's not going to make any sense. I mean, I'm just telling you. Yeah. There, there are very few textual critics who can actually understand it. 
Well, lim- modern evangelicals like to use the catchphrase embarrassment of riches to describe the vast quantity of copies of the New Testament we have. But most Christians throughout history didn't have an embarrassment of riches, right? Why do why do you think it's important to modern Christians to believe that scholars have finally restored the so-called original text, considering most Christians throughout history had Bibles full of errors? And how close do you think we are currently to the original text? These are really good questions, and they're, they're again, very difficult. Um, it only gets I, worse from here. <laughs> the, I don't know of any bona fide scholars who think we have in every detail the original text. Even, you know, I've, I've debated Dan Wallace a number of times, and, you know, he, and he has a, a more optimistic view of things than I do, but he agrees. There are passages where we don't know, or where, no, I can change it. There are passages where we wholeheartedly disagree. I don't mean me and Dan. I mean, everybody in the field disagrees. Is it worded this way or that way? This way or that way? There are tons of verses like that. I mean, Dan would agree with that. Um, uh, so we don't know. Um, the question is how close are we? And the embarrassment of riches is all about the fact that there are more manuscripts of the New Testament than for any other book from the ancient world, flat out. And, you know, people raise this with me as if like I didn't know this. Uh, Yeah, this is this is right. It's completely common knowledge. It's true. And it's no it's not an accident. It's true. It's not a miracle. It's true. Who's copying books throughout most of Western history? Monks and monasteries <laughs> until about the 16th century. That was it. And so so what books are they going to copy? Are they more likely to copy Paul's letters or Plato's dialogue? <laughs> what do you think? Paul was scripture for them. So, of course, they cover copy Paul's letters more. And so, yes, of course, we have more. That is true. It's also true that as a result of that, we have far more textual differences in the New Testament than for any other book from the ancient world. So many that scholars have not been able to count them all. The latest estimates say that there are up to 500,000 differences in our manuscripts, half a million differences. Now, what, what people get upset with me is when I say that, but then I go on to say, which is also absolutely true, the vast majority of these don't matter for squat. They don't. They, like, scribes can't spell. Every time you misspell a word, it's a difference. Okay, well, who cares? I don't really care much. But I mean, so that's that's absolutely true. But there are some big differences. And that's and what I want to yeah. Our time is so, so limited. I'd love to just squeeze more out of you. Uh, this is amazing. Uh, so have you ever heard of a, a, a Christian apologist, Jonathan McClatchy? I don't recall. So he's a Christian apologist, of course, who has actually written articles. And this is what he says in 2000 or in 2020, a Christian apologist named Jonathan McClatchy published three um, scathing blog articles criticizing Jesus interrupted for alleged misrepresentations and distortions, which you can go down in the description and check out all three of these articles for yourself. We won't have time to address all of his critics. Critique, sorry, but I have picked out certain examples that I think might be interesting to discuss. And of course, you'll get right, you, you'll know exactly where we're going with this, and I'll have images and everything. So, homo teluton, that's one heck of a word. I'd like to start with one example in particular that I think is really interesting. McClatchy quoted a paragraph from Jesus Interrupted, which he evidently copied manually. And in doing so, he left out a huge t- chunk of a sentence. Before we address his critique, let's just correct the record and clarify how and why McClatchy's quotation differs from the original text of your book. So let me pull this image up from... uh, Who who is this guy? He's a Christian apologist. Uh, I'd say he's on the up and coming when it comes to, um, you know... Can you see that, by the way? I I can see it. Okay, so in he says, he's quoting you, right? In Matthew, it says, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. And ultimately, if, if you don't mind me, I'm going to go. He says, uh, McClatchy's omission is rather striking since it demonstra- it's demonstrably false because it comes out where it says, I am t- taking here the original wording of the verse as found in most English translation. And you actually say the opposite when he's trying to scathe you in his article, but it's a mistake. Uh, so the textual variant is not actually in most English translations. And if anyone bothers to, ch- to fact check this quote, they'll find that you actually stated the opposite. And so with that opposite, make sure you guys, you can go back and pause this video if you want to see the screenshot. Wait, put, sure. put, put it back up again. Put it up okay. Again, 
Whoops. Because I want to point something out about it. Yes, sir. Hold on. Let me pull that one back up. I apologize. I ended up uh, closing that. One second. I believe we're there. Yes. Yes, sir. I see. You're saying it's homo tell you, Tom, because the word found occurs twice. And you, yes. you're, suspecting, you're suspecting that his eye skipped. Are those on? Are they on subsequent lines in the book? Yes, and I'm about to show you the second image, which actually points this even better for us, real quick here. And I, I love this because this is the perfect example from someone like him who's actually trying to scathe you. This is exactly in the vein of what you're trying to say. So, I know, but see, he could he could claim it was an accident, but I'm not. Yeah, it may well, have it, been an accident. I it mean, may, who knows? It, no, it may have. It may. It looks like it could well have been an accident. But it's we want to catch possible, that. It's also possible that he did it on purpose. Interesting, because a lot of Christians listen to him. And I think it's important we get into some of the juicy stuff where he's trying to say your contradiction claims aren't valid. And, and it'll be interesting to hear your thoughts on this. But I wanted everyone to see, including McClatchy, I hope you see this, that uh, you have also fallen into the same situation where mistakes happen. And this is right in the vein of Dr. Bart Ehrman's work. So I ask all the Christians who are afraid of Bart Ehrman, Continue to be afraid, okay? <laughs> I'm just teasing. In his article, he says, uh, don't be afraid of the big bad wolf, Bart Ehrman, you know, like he goes into all this. So we're going to go into the voice at Jesus' baptism. McClatchy's you know, the, the stuff yes, I'm saying, by the way, is like there's almost nothing in these books that I came up with. Nothing. Almost not in the books he's talking about. This quoting Jesus, that's all just common knowledge. So it's just people get upset with me because, I mean, scholars have known this stuff for centuries. Okay, mm -hmm. go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> No, I appreciate it. Seriously. Uh, so we're going to talk about the voice at Jesus baptisms and his objection is that the textual variant you cited is highly contested. Do you actually believe that today I have begotten you is the original reading of Luke 3 22. Can you elaborate on this? And let me pull up the image for everyone who's uh, watching to get aware of the particular passage. And, um, Hope you could see that. Can you explain what it means when the textual apparatus, or we're, we're, we're leaving that. So let me have you comment first on this. Today so, I have begotten you, and you believe this comes, I believe, from the, is it the Eastern text or the? No, we don't do it that way anymore. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, but yeah, you it'd be called the Western text. Um, yes. So, um, all right. So here's the deal. Uh, did he get this out of my Jesus Interrupted book? I believe so, so. Yeah. So, so, okay. The, the deal is this, you know, I was, I was um, in the course of that argument, I was trying to make a point about things and I wasn't trying to prove anything about Luke 322. If you want, if he wants to, I don't know if he reads scholarly works or not. If he does read scholarship, then I'd suggest he look at my discussion of this passage in my book, the Orthodox corruption of scripture, because I have an extensive, argument for why the text originally said, today I have begotten you, um, from Psalm 2-7. Um, it is found, it's found only in Codex Bizet, as he says. Um, um, uh, I, well, he doesn't actually say that, but that is where it's only. It's found in Codex Bizet and in a group of Latin manuscripts. And so usually that's thought of as a Western variation that you know, people look at, but usually they think, yeah, probably not, but you have to look at the other evidence. Mm -hmm. And the most striking thing is when this verse gets quoted in early church fathers prior to any of our manuscripts, this is the form of the text they have. So that's why even if it's wacky and crazy stuff comes up in those- Well, it's videos. not wacky and crazy because church fathers thought that this was accurate. And, it's, and it's not, and it's not, um, you can see why there's a big argument. See, it isn't just like, oh, is it in, you know, 200 manuscripts versus one manuscript? Yeah, that's that's how you argue if you're not trained. But I mean, if you actually know anything about this field, it doesn't work like that. <laughs> the, way it, the way it works is you mount an argument based both on which manuscripts have it, how many, not so much how many manuscripts, what the quality of the manuscripts are, what the date of the manuscripts are, but also which is the author more likely to have written given everything else we know about his theology, his word usage. Uh, you do a whole analysis of the verse in light of all of Luke and Acts, and then you decide which of these two variant readings, you've got two different ways of reading, which one is a scribe more likely to have uh, wanted to change. Mm. 
Good point. And so, like, and and what evidence do you have for that? So it's a lengthy argument. And so if I gave an argument like that, every time I mentioned Luke 3.22, every book of mine would be 20 times larger than it is. So of course I don't say this every time. Just if you really want to see the argument, don't, don't look at a book where I don't give the argument. Read my argument. And if you disagree with my argument, let me hear about it. I mean, because it's not, I'm not saying that it's definitely, you know, I'm just saying the probability is this. And it's not a weird claim at all. Thank you, this Dr. Is, this, is what, this is what scholars say. I mean, I'm so not, you know, there are debates about this verse. Yeah, yeah. And by yeah, the way, yeah. if he thinks that we have the original text, why do experts disagree on this verse? Right, what are they disagreeing right. on? Great point. Matthew's dual donkeys. McClatchy quotes <laughs> Jesus interrupted, and this is a good one. In Matthew, Jesus' disciples procure two animals for him, a donkey and a colt. They spread their garments over the two of them, and Jesus rode into town straddling them both, Matthew 21, 7. It's an odd image, but Matthew made Jesus fulfill the prophecy of Scripture quite literally. McClatchy claims that Matthew is indicating that Jesus sat on the cloaks, not that he sat on both the donkeys and the colt and the uh, the donkey and the colt at the same time. In fact, he points out since the colt has had never been ridden, the mother donkey is actually there for some kind of moral support. <laughs> and so let me pull up this That's image good. for you. <laughs> yes. Good. Okay, it's, moral support. We like that. Yeah, all right. And here is the parallel to the passages. And if, I think if you look at the bottom of these, it's really interesting between each of these. Uh, Matthew has it in plural. They brought the donkey and the colt and placed them on their cloaks. And then here it says, they brought the colt, singular, to Jesus and threw it on it, singular, their cloaks, and he sat on it, singular. But um, Matthew's clearly adding the colt's mother in the scene where Luke ad adheres closely to Mark, who has only one animal. You can see that Matthew converts all the singular references to plural, and it seems like he needs two animals to fulfill prophecy. Apparently, Christian apologists are totally fine with Jesus walking on water, but they draw the line at Jesus riding two donkeys. Do you think McClatchy's interpretation is reasonable? Can you elaborate on Matthew's use of Zechariah 9.9? And I'll bring up that image if you'd like to elaborate. Uh, I'm just trying to figure out what translation this is that he's using. I believe, uh, if I'm not mistaken, this RSV here, and this is not him. This is actually my buddy who's oh. who, uh, who put this image together, Stephen Nelson. But um, are you seeing any conflicts there already? Or I'm, I'm just having a little trouble understanding. In in um, I'm a little understanding. So. So the, the, the apologist is simply trying to say that he didn't ride on two donkeys. He rode on one. No, I just I, I got that part. Okay. I'm yes, just sir. trying to understand his argument that he's not sitting on the donkeys. So in, in Mark right here, the way that he's trying to argue this, and maybe you can talk about the Greek. Okay, look. Okay, yeah, I mean, th let me just put it like this. Even if you go with his argument that he's not saying, they have put yeah, the cloaks on the two animals. Whatever the whatever he's sitting on is plural. He's sitting on the cloaks, but if the cloaks are on both animals, he's not sitting on some of the cloaks. <laughs> yeah, it's it's the, the the I guess you'd say the referent the antecedent here is um No, I get it. No, cold. I get it. You're right well, that it's the cult, but he's trying to say it's the. No, cloak. I get it. No, he's saying they spread the cloaks on. He's sitting on the cloaks. Yes. I get it. But they put the cloaks on both. On, he's sitting on whatever they've. In his view, they're, they're. He's sitting on the things they spread over the cloak, over the colt and the donkey. Right. Right. They spread them over both of them. So if he's actually sitting on the things that were put on the colt and the donkey, then he's sitting on both the colt and the donkey, because the cloaks are on both the colt and the donkey. <laughs> what, what about Zechariah? Look, look, this is not look, this is not my argument anyway. If you want it, one of the most one of the best commentaries on the Gospel of, uh, of Matthew, written in modern times, is by John Meyer, a senior a professor of uh, New Testament, He's retired now from Notre Dame, who's also written the most massive study of the historical Jesus. And this is his argument. And uh, you know. Just about everybody agrees with the argument. They just have different. They just say, "Well, you know, that uh, you know, it's it's metaphorically or something." But you know, it's 
It looks like he's sitting on a cold in the donkey. So whatever. So I guess a simple question would be in light of the Zechariah thing, do you, um, was the author of Matthew simply misrepresenting the Greek translation or do you think he could actually read the Hebrew text? What was the point of Matthew's going out of his way to add the second animal to the scene, if not to fulfill prophecy? Uh, I'm not quite sure what you're asking Just, because Zechariah has, has two animals. Right. And I think that's why the simple question is, isn't that why Matthew's using two animals instead of Mark's singular animal? Yes. Yeah. No, the whole point is, is that when Zechariah uses the two animals, so Zechariah is using a, a, um, a, a, po a poetic form called synonymous parallelism, where, and you find this throughout the entire, I mean, all the poetry of the Old Testament, the Psalms, the Proverbs, they'll, they'll, state, they'll state something on one line, and then they'll give the same idea in the next line with different words. So they're not rhyming, you know, they're not rhyming words at the end of the sentence, they're kind of rhyming ideas. And so Zechariah is doing that. And so the first line and the second line are parallel to each other. So everything that he says in the first line, he says in the second line using different words. And the point is that Matthew seems to, in this case, think to be a literal interpretation of this. He's got to have both animals, even though they're supposed to be synonymous, the same animal. And so the point is, is that he, uh, Matthew has taken something literally that was meant to be poetic. Interesting. Thank you. Next topic. When was this the current... When was the curtain in the temple ripped? Uh, McClatchy quotes Jesus interrupted. According to Mark's gospel, after Jesus breathes his last, the curtain of the temple is torn in half. Luke's gospel also indicates that the curtain in the temple was ripped in half. Oddly enough, it does not rip after Jesus dies, but it is explicitly said to rip while Jesus is still alive and hanging on the cross. McClatchy asks rhetorically, but is that what the text of Mark and Luke says? So here is an image I, I like to give the visuals uh, to yeah. give people an example. Thank you so much, Stephen Nelson, for doing this, man. I appreciate it. Um, so McClatchy argues, quote, from the translation found in the English Standard Version, it is easy to see how Ehrman came to the conclusion he did. And for some illiterate, uh, someone illiterate in the Greek, this mistake might be excusable. However, notice the jab here. <laughs> Airman is an expert. Yeah, I can't read Greek. Greek. I, I should learn that language sometime. <laughs> this is exactly what he says. He says, however, Airman is an expert in Greek, and so this mistake is quite inexcusable. The ESV translation of Luke 23, 46 says, following the tearing of the curtain, then Jesus calling out with a loud voice said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And having said this, he breathed his last. The English translation makes it sound like Jesus died following the tearing of the, the curtain. However, this is not at all clear in the Greek. The Greek word translated then is kai, which is a conjunction normally translated and. It is temporarily nonspecific, and ancient writers, including the New Testament authors, frequently used kai when narrating events achronologically. That is, without a respect to chronological sequence. Thus, both Mark and Luke are ambiguous as to the exact order of these events, and both are even consistent with the tearing of the temple curtain being simultaneous with Jesus' death. Would you like to comment on this? Yeah, I would like him to give me, let's say, three examples in Luke's passion narrative where he's, he's narrating events, one after another, and he uses Kai to show me that the second one happened before the first. Three other examples. Give me three other examples of that in Luke's account of Jesus' passion, where he's chronologically narrating what happened. He uses Kai to separate one thing from another, and the second thing is understood to happen before the first thing. Give me three examples. Thank you, Dr. Airman. We'll go on to the next one. You heard that. So be on the lookout. <laughs> I feel like I'm, I'm like Jerry Springer in the middle of, uh, uh, you know, this uh, this this match going on here. I'm just teasing. Not so, much of a match. I mean, the things he's saying, I mean, nobody agrees with. So, I mean, you know, it's right. nice and apologies to say it, but I mean, get it. Yeah. Okay, go ahead. My friend Stephen Nelson, who knows biblical Greek, provided this reference from a biblical Greek textbook and noted the following about McClatchy's interpretation. Uh, Luke surely has Jesus dying after the tearing of the temple curtain uh, because he dies after calling out with a loud voice and after saying his last words. These are two successive aortist part participles, which establish a clear sequence of events. The tearing of the temple curtain and Jesus' last breath can't be happening at the same time in Luke, even if it were plausible reading in Mark and Matthew, where those events are directly in sequence. Dr. Aaron, do you concur with this analysis? I don't think so, because the uh, if you could put the Greek up again, I can explain why. Yes, sir. Let me pop that back up. The issue is going to be that that 
um, our apologist friend is not basing this on the on the relationship between the participle and the verb that's governing it. He's basing it on the conjunction chi. Okay, I think this is it. So he's not saying he he. Um, Am I right here? Yeah. So what he said, what 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 your friend Steve Nelson is saying is that the phonesis. I think that's what he's saying. The phonesis has to happen before the apen. I'm sorry, but do this in English. The calling out happens before the said, and uh, this after saying happens before breathed out, and that that is that's absolutely right, but that's not the uh, our apologist friend's argument. Right. His argument is that the and means that. Hold on a second. Oh, well, now that's interesting. Yeah. He's saying that all of verse two happened before verse one. Right. So it's not, so verse two is where you have those two participles that are dependent on main verbs. And he's saying he would agree with the sequencing within the verse, I assume, if he knows Greek, which I assume he does. Um, if, but he's saying that the and at the beginning of verse two doesn't mean that it happened next. It, it means, uh, uh, that, that verse two actually is happening before verse one. And I'm asking him, give me three examples of that. Awesome. Thank you so much. We did a lot of good slides here. I think these are wonderful for people to kind of keep track of. So, all right. Um, if the author huh. John wanted to convey, uh, yes. sorry, Jesus miracles and John, this is, this is something interesting that you, you made a comment on and he wrote about. So McClatchy quotes from Jesus and erupted. Jesus performs his first miracle in chapter two when he returns the water into wine or when he turns the water into wine, a favorite miracle story on colleague campuses. And we're told that this was the first sign that Jesus did. Later in that chapter, we're told that Jesus did many signs in Jerusalem. And then in chapter four, he heals the son of a centurion. And the author says, this was the second sign that Jesus did. Huh? One sign, many signs, then a second sign? This is uh, quoting you. McClatchy's objection is that the signs performed in Galilee were merely the first and second signs performed in that particular location, and that the other signs performed in Jerusalem don't actually count as signs performed in Galilee. And of course, in the image, you could see the comparison. If the author of John wanted to convey the idea that this was now the second sign that Jesus did in Galilee, why doesn't he just say that? How does McClatchy's reading hold up in like, uh, in in like of the phrase, when he had come from Judah, Judea to Galilee. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it depends how you want to translate the Greek here. Um, scholars have made a big deal of this thing that you get the first sign and then the second sign, then signs in between the signs, and um, so that then really look like the second sign. And it has to do again. It has to do with how you translate a part of participle. Um, in this particular case. My view is that what 5.4 is saying is this now is the second sign that Jesus did. Uh, he did this sign after he came from Judea to Galilee. But the emphasis is um, uh, that, that, I mean, it's true. These are two signs that he's done um, in Galilee. But, you know, even with, uh, I don't know if that made sense what I just said just now, but let me put it like this. Oh, put it, no, put it back up because I need it to understand what I'm saying. <laughs> okay, yes, so sir. If you read it the way he says you're supposed to read it, he's saying that uh, the first signs when he was in Galilee, does many signs in Jerusalem, second signs when he's back in Galilee. Right. Okay. But it actually doesn't say that. It says this is the second sign he did after having come from Judea to Galilee. But in his reckoning, it's the second sign. See what I mean? Yeah. Whereas in my way of reading it, he does the first sign, he does the many signs, and then the author, you know, it's a it's a discrepancy. The author says this is the second sign, but he's just telling you this second sign was done, af done after he had come from Judea. So I don't have a discrepancy. I mean, the, the way I, it's really hard to explain this stuff without the Greek. Um, <laughs> but, uh, it, okay, it's the, way you, it's the way you translate the participle. He ends up translating in a way that doesn't make sense of the word second. 
because he doesn't think this is the second sign he did after he came from Judea to Galilee. But the way he's translating the participle, it does mean it's the second sign he did after he came from Judea to Galilee. Because his first sign was just when he was in Galilee. Right. The beginning of his signs. Right. But how many women went to the tomb? McClatchy quotes Jesus interrupted. Who actually went to the tomb? Was it Mary alone? Mary and another Mary? Mary Magdalene? Mary, the mother of James and Salome? Or women who had accompanied Jesus from Galilee to Jerusalem, possibly Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary, the mother of James and other women. McClatchy points out the fact that Mary Magdalene says, we do not know where they've laid him in John 20, verse two. And he claims that this presupposes that other women were present with her at the tomb. So according to McClatchy, there is no contradiction here at all. And I'll pull up the image for you. And it is interesting. Me and my buddy uh, went over this last night. Like it's singular all the way to this very part. Like if you look at John 20 and you can, you know, you can compare all the synoptics, but in John 20, she saw that the tomb and then she ran and then she said, and then you get down here at the, the end and we do not know where they had laid him. He uses this little plural spot right here where we is to argue, oh, this right here is, you know, uh, evidence of a plural women at the tomb. So it kind of depends on what you're trying to do with these passages. Um, if what you're trying to do is to figure out a way to reconcile them, then this, this, is a way, this is a way to do it. It actually doesn't reconcile them because it doesn't tell, because as you, as you can see, Matthew, Mark, and uh, Luke don't all say the same thing either. Right. But it would allow uh, that Mary Magdalene went with somebody. Then you'd have to ask, why doesn't John tell you who the other one is? And if you only read up through, uh, she said, uh, so, she, so she, um, she saw that the tomb had been taken away from the, the stone had been taken away from. If you only read that far, what would you think had happened so far? You think that Mary Magdalene had gone to the tomb, right? If he said she says we don't know where they have laid him. Um, if I were a fundamentalist, what I would say is. Uh, the, the reason she says we don't know where they've laid him is because she went off and first she conferred with her other with other people. They didn't know either. So she went to uh, Peter and said, we don't know. You see, if you, in other words, if you want to play that game, you could play it either direction. And so how do you know which one is right? Hmm. So I choose not to play that game. And when when John says it's Mary Magdalene, so the deal with John is, as you as you probably know, John, like the other Gospels, is made up of lots of different sources, and there's lots of internal inconsistencies, partly because he's woven sources together, which is why you have that problem with the signs, and, and partly because uh, he's not careful in his editing. And so um, stories sometimes come from different sources, and when you do that, you get in, inconsistency. Somebody could just as well say that this is an inconsistency, that the we is an inconsistency. Hmm. Thank you for answering that. I appreciate it. And we're going to move on to where was Jesus after the baptism? <laughs> you know, uh, all of these are McClatchy's uh, issues with with what you presented. And I, I figured it'd be great. I, I'm sorry that we're spending so much time. No, with no, it's you. fine. You know, when I was a fundamentalist, I had the same kinds of views. So I, right. I, I understand. In fact, I had exactly these views. I, I understand them. Where was Jesus after the baptism? McClatchy quotes Jesus interrupted. In Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the so-called synoptic gospels, Jesus, after this, after his baptism, goes off into the wilderness where he will be tempted by the devil. Mark especially is quite clear about the matter of, uh, for he states, after telling of the baptism that Jesus left immediately for the wilderness. What about John? In John, there is no account of Jesus being tempted by the devil in the wilderness. The day after John the Baptist has borne witness to the Spirit descending on Jesus as a dove at baptism, he sees Jesus again and declares him to be the Lamb of God. John is explicit, stating that this occurred the next day. Jesus then starts gathering his disciples around him and launches into his public ministry by performing his mi miracles of turning water into wine. So where was Jesus the next day? It depends on which gospel you read. And of course, looking here, this is McClatchy's objection, quote, this then is not the baptism narrative itself, but rather John giving testimony to what had happened on an earlier occasion. Bart Ehrman once again has simply misread the text. 
end quote. I'm not exactly sure what McClatchy means by on an earlier occasion, if he means that this... <laughs> oh, that's a good one. That's yeah. good. <laughs> yeah, you like this. <laughs> that's pretty funny. You want me to finish saying this or you want to go ahead and jump into it? No, go ahead. Keep going. <laughs> okay, so if he means that this occasion was in fact Jesus' baptism, I suppose his interpretation makes sense. But if he's implying that the spirit descended from heaven like a dove on two separate occasions, then that seems a little odd. Do you think this is John's way of narrating Jesus' baptism without narrating the actual baptism, Dr. Ehrman? Um, so if you actually read the passage, <laughs> um, John 1.29, you have to start with John 1.29, where the passage begins. And it begins with, on the next day. And the next day, so John saw Jesus coming to him, and he said, behold, be, behold the Lamb of God. And he goes on to talk about Jesus. He begins talking about Jesus in verse, at the end of verse 29. He talks about him in verse 30. Uh, this is the one I meant when I said, continues talking about him in verse 31. Uh, I, I myself did not know him. Goes on, uh, verse 32, and John gave his testimony. I saw the Spirit coming down upon him. Uh, he's talking about Jesus and Jesus coming to him to be baptized and Jesus being baptized. Chapter 1, verse 29 to chapter 29, verse 34. The next word is the next day. So the next day is in relationship to the day that John was speaking. You'll notice that in verse 29 uh, and in uh, verse thir 35, it begins exactly the same way. In Greek, it's te eparion, on the next day. He's narrating a sequence of events day by day. On one day, he came to John. John, uh, John saw the Spirit coming upon him. He told the others about it. The next day, Jesus, uh, Jesus calls his disciples, and it goes from there. Mm. No temptation in the wilderness. No 40 days away. <laughs> I love this. I am very blessed to be able to sit here with you and learn and uh, get your insight on this. I so hope we can do this again. Here's another one. <clears throat> squeezing in everything we can. Guys, we're squeezing a camel through the eye of a needle right now, so please bear with us. Does Acts contradict Paul regarding his visit to Jerusalem? McClatchy pushes back against the idea that Acts contradicts Paul by claiming that Paul simply had no reason to mention all of the events in his itinerary. McClatchy quotes, Jesus interrupted, this emphatic statement that Paul is not lying should give us pause. He is completely clear. He did not consult with any others after his conversion, did not see any of the apostles for three years, and then he did not see any except Kephas, Peter, and J Jesus' brother James. This makes the account found in the book of Acts very interesting indeed. For according to Acts 9, immediately after Paul converted, he spent some time in Damascus with the disciples. And when he left the city, he headed directly to Jerusalem, where he met with the apostles of Jesus. On all counts, Acts seems to be at odds with Paul. Did he spend time with other Christians immediately, Acts, or not, Paul? Did he go straight to Jerusalem, Acts, or not? Paul. Did he meet with a group of apostles, Acts, or just with Peter and James, Paul? And so obviously you see in the slide, McClatchy asks, quote, now how long a period of time is denoted by many days? Get this. Take a look at 1 Kings 2, 38 through 39, McClatchy says, where many days in Hebrew is immediately glossed as three years, end quote. Dr. Ehrman? <laughs> So okay, so, so let me ask let me ask Sorry. let me ask him this. Yeah, leave that up. Let me ask him this. The Septuagint is a translation of First Kings two that was done centuries after First Kings two. The translation was not written by the author of First Kings two. First Kings two says it was a long time. He doesn't put the Greek. He doesn't put the Hebrew there, so I don't know right. who it is. Um, he says it's literally many days. I, I'm not going to bother to look it up in Hebrew right now. But, but the the translation of the Septuagint centuries later says three years, and so he says therefore many days means three years, 
And therefore, um, some days in Acts 9, uh, sufficient days, um, it actually doesn't quite say many, it's sufficient some days, um, therefore that might, might mean three years. Um, if I, if I just let me put it like this. Yes. Sir. Suppose, suppose I take a Greek verse in the New Testament, um, and for example, suppose I, um, uh, I don't know. Suppose I take a Greek verse that says "some days" and in Greek, and I translate that into English with the phrase three years." Would you be able to use my English translation of the phrase? My translation is three years, even though the original said many days. Would you be able to use my translation to prove that the author meant three years? Right. You know, the Septuagint translation has no bearing on what First King said. <laughs> this is also another interesting fact. My buddy Stephen threw this in there, and I love Stephen for this because he's so anal about particulars. In Acts 27, in the same book later, you have um, Paul saying, We sailed, or it says, We sailed slowly for many days. Are we going to now interpret that to mean three years? Did he sell for three years? I mean, like, when do you stop? And it's the same Greek word. So in the same book, but he wants to run to the first Kings Old Testament narrative to find a way to squeeze three year three years into many days. That's what he's trying to do. My view on this is, you know, you can, as I was saying earlier, you can reconcile anything. I mean, I was, you know, if you if that's your goal, there there you can literally anything, not just in the Bible, just anything. You can do right. it if you work hard enough. And the question is, you know, why do you want to do that? Um, so when I when I was a fundamentalist, that's what that was my goal because I, I was sure the Bible was inerrant, and since there are no mistakes, there could not be mistakes. Literally, there could not be, so there weren't mistakes, and so the goal was to figure out why it's not a mistake. Mm -hmm. And if that's what you want to do, that's fine. If you want to understand the Bible, though, you should let these authors speak for themselves instead of forcing your meaning onto them. Um, when Acts says after some days, if it means three years. For one thing, the chronology of Acts doesn't work anymore. But moreover, it misses the point of Acts, which is right away, the first thing Paul did, he went to Jerusalem to meet with the apostles. This fits in with, with Acts narrative because he wants the apostles and Paul to agree on everything. You also misunderstand Galatians because Galatians 1, the whole point Paul wants to make is I did not get my message from them. I wasn't even there for three years. By God, I'm not lying. So, yeah, okay. If you want to mean make him say, well, actually, I did go there right away. You know, right after right after Damascus, that's where I went. You know, well, it was three years later. But it's like, no, he was in Arabia. And then, so you know, so you completely misunderstand what he's saying. You really want to misunderstand somebody so he doesn't contradict somebody else. You're misunderstanding both of them for the sole reason of supporting your view instead of letting them speak for themselves. Is that really how you want to interpret texts? I think you know how it is, Dr. Ehrman. You know, when you're when you, when you're coming at it, you say this in every book you write, and I love that about you. You just lay it out there and say, this was everything to me. And so it's like, like uh, the cognitive dissonance, knowing your wife's cheating on you, but you love her to death or something, and you just can't ad admit that there's possibly infidelity taking place. It's emotional. So I try to feel compassion and empathy, and you do too. You do it all the time in your lectures, but there comes a time when reality has to set in, and sometimes you just got to say, guys, figure out a way of Christianity that will work and comply with the evidence that will work with the reality of the world we see and not magical thinking. And so that's just my thoughts. But uh, he, he ends this and concludes by pointing out Luke's omission and Paul's itinerary, quote, but what about the trip to Arabia? Luke is silent on it. But does Luke contradict Paul's claim that he went to Arabia? I would place Paul's trip to Arabia within the many days of Acts 9.23. Paul also informs us in Galatians 1.17 that he returned again to Damascus. So it isn't surprising uh, then that he that his subsequent trip to Jerusalem is from Damascus. End quote. What do you think about the possibility that Paul took a trip to Arabia while the Jews in Damascus were plotting to kill him? Uh, well, I, uh, what do you say? I mean, just anybody, just read, just read it yourself. Acts, 
9, verses 22 and 23, does it seem likely to you that when he says that Saul was in Damascus talking to Jews and that after a few, after some days went by, does that, does that, that the Jews replied, does that suggest that between 22 and 23, he spent three years in Arabia? Does that, is that what makes sense? Okay. Interesting. Does Paul contradict Acts on the number of Jerusalem visits? This is the final graph. And then what I'd like to do is ask you a uh, really down to earth, funny. I think it's, it's just amazing what you've done with your book, Forge to Counter Forgery. Uh, all your literature is just wonderful. And I ask everyone to go in the description. If you have not read Dr. Airman's works, I, you have blasphemed the Holy Spirit. Okay. I'm just saying like, literally, this is just, yeah, I would not say that. <laughs> I'm just teasing. I know. Mm -hmm. I'm just saying your audiobooks are fantastic too. Like on audible, any mm -hmm. trip I take, I listen to it. I can listen to them again and I learn something new every time. So uh, final graph. And then my, uh, excitement on recent stuff I read from you. And then I have to let you go because you obviously have a, another agenda here that's uh, taking place here soon. Um, does Paul contradict Acts on the number of Jerusalem visits? According to Paul, and I think he's quoting you here because um, the way we have it colored. According to Paul's account, the Jerusalem Council was only, was only the second time he had been to Jerusalem. According to Acts, it was his third prolonged trip there. Once again, it appears that the author of Acts has confused some of Paul's itinerary, possibly intentionally for his own purposes. McClatchy asks a rhetorical question. Where does the text say that this was only Paul's second visit to Jerusalem? M McClatchy continues. In fact, we learn from Acts 11 that between those two journeys, Paul had gone to Jerusalem to bring aid to the saints affected by a fam famine. There would have been no purpose in Galatians for Paul to have mentioned this trip as it did not relate to conferring with the apostles about the gospel he was preaching, end quote. It seems like McClatchy's rhetorical question could be asked about his own assertion. Where does the text say that Paul's trip to send aid to Judea was between those two journeys? The one that Paul Paul actually takes care to mention. What do you think about his uh, apologetic strategy for harmonizing Paul and Acts? Well, I think it's very common. I mean, people do this. And, um, you know, Paul's goal in talking about this, I mean, you, you have to read these books, you have to read them and study and see them in the context. When you do that, Paul is trying to explain that he did not spend much time in Jerusalem. He's trying to tell the, and it's probably, we, it looks like he has opponents who are accusing him in Galatia. And it looks like they're saying, look, he's getting all this stuff from the apostles and he's changing it. You know, he's claiming you, you Gentiles don't have to be circumcised, but he got his gospel from these Jerusalem people and they say you do. So, you know, he's changed. And Paul's trying to say, no, look, I haven't changed it. This is what Christ told me when he appeared to me. And I did not consult with them. I went there once after three years, and then I went back 14 years later. I didn't consult with them. So I McClatchy mean, wants us to think that Paul delivered this offering to Jerusalem and like he didn't look up the apostles. Really? And it's very hard to fit that collection, by the way, this early in Paul's minute, this is in Acts, this is af after his first missionary journey. It's quite clear when you read Paul, the Pauline letters. He's, his last letter, uh, Romans, is talking about when he's going to be going to Jerusalem. And so it's at the end of his life. It's not right at the very beginning of his ministry. So there are all sorts of problems with it. But again, look, if, you, what you, if your goal in life is to make sure there are no contradictions in the Bible, you can do that. You can do that with the Quran. You can do that with the Old Testament. You can do that with uh, any biography of Abraham Lincoln, if that's, that really is your goal in life. If, on the other hand, your goal in life is to understand these books, then I suggest you read them carefully and let each author say what he wants to say instead of pretending that he's saying what some other author is saying. I, final question, and I'm going to let you, I, I, I have to let you go because you have an appointment. We talked about this before the show. So thank you so much by, by this far, like Dr. Ehrman, this has really been wonderful interviewing you and having the sure. opportunity. So you writing about forgeries, one of the funniest things you said in your forgery counter forgery book that just, I couldn't help but laugh because I, this was everything to me. This is like life, everything you, to you is James is our pseudo james is arguing against 
Paul in Ephesians, and neither one of them are really James or Paul. Yeah. yeah. That is so hilarious to me that these authors aren't really who they are, you know? Oh, well, yeah, it's kind of even more interesting that, than that in some ways because, you know, it was uh, James and Paul have always, since the Reformation, since Martin Luther, it's been thought that James uh, is opposed to Paul. Um, and that the historical James, the brother of Jesus, was opposed to Paul. And there's very good reason for thinking that James did not write the letter of James. That I mean, somebody named James wrote it, but not the brother of Jesus for reasons I map out at good length in, in my books. But the interesting thing is um, that they're, I don't think they're contradictory. And you, would, you, you probably would expect fundamentalists or evangelicals to think that I think that Paul and James are contradictory. I don't. Because I think that James, who is not the brother of Jesus, is actually conflicting with an interpretation of Paul that Paul himself did not have. Hmm. He's, con he's what he's contradicting is the understanding of Paul that you find in books like Ephesians that Paul did not write. And so he's attacking a, a view of Paul that Paul would not have recognized. Paul did not think that you were going to be saved without living an ethical life. But you weren't going to be you you weren't going to be saved by living an ethical life. But if you are a follower of Jesus, of course you're going to live an ethical life for Paul. James is attacking people who say it doesn't matter what you do. For pa Paul's letters, a third of each of his letters is telling people what they have to do. <laughs> so he, he really thinks it matters what you do. Uh, and so James is attacking someone else, and it's not Paul. <laughs> and so wow. yeah, this yeah. leads us right into. Dr. Jason Staples' work. I was. I'd love to get your thoughts on Romans nine eleven. Can two, one sentence? What do you think about his work? Well, he was my student. He wrote this under my direction. This Did he convince my, you? Um, he came close to convincing me, <laughs> which is more than most of my students do. <laughs> there you go, Jason I think, Staples. I think he makes it, look, I think he has a very impressive book that is a thorough study of what it would mean for somebody like Paul to say that all Israel will be saved. It's a really difficult verse. We all have our interpretations of it, but he has a very uh, novel and important interpretation. And so, I, and he, he knows a lot about this. Yeah. He knows a lot about this. <laughs> Connect me with him. Connect me with him. Thank oh, you no, so much. Just write him an email. <laughs> Doesn't he oh, respond? Yeah. <laughs> I am. He's a busy man too. You know? Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, there's also, there are all sorts of issues that would require significant discussion. And one of the frustrations with, with some debate formats is that you've got lots of things to say and you, you don't have a chance to say them. There'll also, there'll also be uh, questions and answers and there'll be, you know, so it's, it'll be mixed up. It's not just going to be hearing me drone on for 40 minutes and hearing him drone on for 40 minutes and hearing him. It's like, it's not going to be like that. It's actually going to be active with a lot of, a lot of different components to it. Um, but there's so much to talk about. I mean, if you're talking about the resurrection, uh, for one thing, you're talking about, um, what kind of sources do you have? And it has to do with, can you trust the Gospels? So it's really a much bigger question than the resurrection. It's, can you trust the Gospels when they say something? In the four Gospels, the main thing they want to say is that Jesus died for your sins and he was raised from the dead. Well, is do they present a you know reliable case for that? So that's one kind of set of questions, and we'll talk about the Gospels. Um, Mike and I have very different views about the New Testament. And... Uh, certainly different views about whether historians can talk about things like, is the Bible inspired? I mean, how can a historian talk about whether the Bible is inspired? Of course, a historian might think the Bible is inspired, might believe that, but is that a historical statement? I mean, how, do you, how, how can a historian show what God's doing? You know, try and show me what God did yesterday. Really? How do you do that as a historian? And so, so you have questions about the inspiration of the Bible and whether it's trustworthy and, um, and, because, okay, then you've got issues of history. I mean, do historians, I was just indicating, do historians talk about things like resurrections? Um, if you talk about resurrection of Jesus and say that you can historically demonstrate it, okay, which other resurrections can you demonstrate? Oh, no, just that one. Why just that one? There are others talked about in ancient sources. Uh, yeah, but it's, this is the one that's best attested. Really? Okay. So you mean if you have three people who say that it, then that's it's, then you can do that historically. But if you only have two, it's what? And so you know. And so, but the big question is, I mean, can historians talk about miracles at all? I mean, how? 
what what historian talks about miracles exactly? I mean, you know, name me a historian of the Revolutionary War that describes the miracles that happened. Mm. You don't, I mean, the life of Napoleon, do you describe miracles? Do you do, I mean, what? No, of course not. I mean, read a biography of Washington. You don't read about miracles. What? Why not? Because historians don't deal with miracles. So to say that historians ought to show that the miracle of Jesus' resurrection happened, what does that even mean? Historians don't deal with that kind of thing. So, so this begs this begs me to ask that, you know, are the, like historical evidence wise, if we're looking at sources, um, is resurrection something that happened more often than once? You you say yes. Can you give me a few examples real quick? Uh, well, I can certainly give examples of people who um, who were taken up to heaven mm -hmm. uh, when they died, who were uh, who were um, were alive one minute and up in heaven the next. <laughs> And so, I mean, the founder of Rome, Romulus, mm -hmm. <laughs> was taken up to heaven without dying. A co near contemporary of Jesus, Apollonius of Tiana, was put up for charges before the Roman authorities and uh, and ascended to heaven. And so um, you certainly have people brought back from the dead. Um, the thing about the resurrection of Jesus, though, is uh, an important point that Mike and I would both agree on, is that it is not being described as a near-death experience. And so if you've got somebody in the Gospels, for example, who dies and then is brought back from the dead, you could say, yeah, well, they had a near-death experience, you know, happened to a cousin of mine. Um, but in the case of Jesus, the whole point is that he, he didn't come back from the dead to die again later. The resurrections that he was he died was taken up to heaven. He, he was really ra raised all the way up, <laughs> mm -hmm. not just raised to live around and live for another 20 years. And so that's that's the miracle. And that's what you can attest in other sources for other people. So this question, I, I kind of phrased this conversation in a way of saying, you know, you're going to show why you can't historically, you know, demonstrate that the resurrection happened. But the question I'd like to know is, is it historically demonstrable that Jesus probably didn't resurrect? So while he's going to be making a case to say he did and you're going to say, no, look, you can't. Are you taking a neutral position and saying you can't and historians shouldn't? Or is there evidence based on these sources to maybe think actually he didn't rise and another phenomena might be taking place? Yeah, I, I mean, I don't think Jesus rose from the dead. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to be showing why I think that. Um, I mean, but the thing is, it's really, I mean, at the end of the day, it's not a discussable item historically and so so that has to be laid out pretty carefully because people will say things like what's the best evidence and my view is there's no evidence how can you have evidence for a miracle but um there are reasons for thinking he wasn't raised from the dead i mean for example our sources are hopelessly confused on the major points about the resurrection and so are these the kinds of sources the sources are written by people who are fervently believing in, in Jesus. And are these the kinds of sources you use to that a historian wants? And so the reason, the one reason for thinking he wasn't raised from the dead is because I don't think there was a tomb. <laughs> but I mean, I don't think there were, I mean, Romans didn't allow people to be buried. And so, um, uh, so I, uh, so I will be my, I will be mounting arguments for why I don't think it happened. But my, my bottom line is going to be that even if it did happen, it's not a historical belief. belief. There aren't historical beliefs. <laughs> there's, there's history. And if you've got beliefs, that's something other than history. Mm. You know, I thought about this as well. While Christians love to talk about the resurrection, Dr. Ehrman, I wondered if we could tackle it in, let's put it like this, apocalyptic prophet. The way you wrote your book about this Jesus figure who's waiting on the end Christians love to die on the hill arguing about this resurrection idea that Jesus rose from the dead because it is the center to their faith. But if we can show demonstrably that expectations that were supposed to happen, like Mark 13 and the end of the world, the new heaven and new earth, et cetera, et cetera, were anticipated to happen within his lifetime, and even he can't get that right, but we're supposed to believe God raised him from the dead, isn't this another way of approaching it saying, what are the likeliness that this actually happened. This guy rose from the dead, but he can't even get the end of the world correct. You could you could argue that. Um, I don't think it would be effective because uh, your opponent will say, actually, you're misinterpreting those verses uh, <laughs> and that Jesus didn't make that prediction. And, and others could say, look, um, just because God raised him from the dead doesn't mean he was perfect. 
um, I know uh, I know Christians who think that Jesus actually committed sins, uh, but and that he wasn't all knowledgeable, he wasn't almighty, he was he was a human, but that God raised him from the dead, and so I don't think his humanity necessarily um, is a you know is a trump card against the resurrection. Hmm. Well, I thought that the I would think that an apocalyptic prophet's thinking the final resurrection would happen. Like that was part of the expectation is that it wasn't just Jesus's resurrection that was anticipated. And I know that there are various voices and the New Testament is not one cohesive message on this topic. Uh, but Paul seems to have said, well, he's the son of God since he was raised, but he's the first fruit of the resurrection. Like meaning there's going to be some following very soon after this. Um yeah. I think that's right. That is what I think Jesus did think it was going to happen in this generation. So it just developed. It's a developing, like you say, there's like tree tree rings that keep developing out from an original apocalyptic prophet. I mean, when, when I was in seminary, Princeton Theological Seminary, I'd say a large number of my colleagues who were studying for ministry agreed that Jesus was wrong about when it was going to happen. And they, they thought he got raised from the dead. And so I don't think those two things are linked the way that an outsider would think they are linked. <laughs> you think, well, you know, you can't have both ways. Well, yeah, people do have it both ways because they say, look, he's fully human and fully divine. But if he's fully human, it means he's fully human. And yeah. I just see so many problems with, you, you know, where I'm coming from. Of course, I'm coming yeah, yeah, from that's, why we're not that's why we're not believers, but it's not a yeah. logical contradiction. Is okay. Yeah. Let, let, look, you just mentioned he's man, he's God, he's both. Uh, this raises some red flags in my ears. Um, you know, there are a lot of scholars like you who will say there's this development that is growing about this divinity of this guy named Jesus. And, you know, I was listening to an interview last week with uh, Mike Jones, Inspiring Philosophy. He's a huge Christian apologist YouTube channel asking Mike Lycona about Jesus being God in Mark, right? And he said, look, uh, can you show us how he's equated with Yahweh in Mark? And, um, you know, I still, even as a non-believer, wouldn't have a problem if they found remnants or elements of this, so, so to speak, uh, in Mark. But he used the example of Jesus walking on water to show Yahweh walked on water. These are elements within Mark that are kind of, you see where I'm going with this. Yeah, How, I know. I know this, yeah. Yeah. What, do you, what do you say to that? It's completely bogus. How would you respond to the walking on water particular? The early Christian view is that God gave Jesus his authority. It didn't make him God. It didn't make him Yahweh. Yahweh bestowed his own authority on Jesus. So that so if Jesus does something that Yahweh did, that's because he was authorized to do it. That's how it worked in the ancient world. If you were the king and you uh, you sent a uh, like a messenger, the messenger was treated like you. Like if you sent a messenger to a village, you know, they would they would treat him like the king because uh, he's representing you and he has your authority. Jesus in the early Christian tradition had God's authority. And so he was treated like God. But there's a difference between having the authority of God and being equal with God. And the difference between that and being identical with God. Being identical with Yahweh, I don't know, these evangelicals who say this thing, I just, I'm puzzled by it. And, you know, I know people have been writing about, you know, can't understand why I'm puzzled because this is what people have always said. No, they have not always said it. And quoting Justin Martyr at me is pointless, by the way. I don't know, you probably don't read this, but I mean, <laughs> you, I just think that, you know, they, I'm, I'm sorry, this is not the historical view of Christianity so far as I know, and I've studied it for a long time. So maybe if people can point, it, point me to a, a correction, like in the New Testament, <laughs> so I'd be fine. But the fact Jesus walks on the water, yes, of course Mark portrays Jesus walking. And yes, Mark does see Jesus as a divine being. Uh, I agree. Mark ascribes divinity to Jesus. Mm -hmm. He does not think he's Yahweh. The idea that Yahweh and Jesus, I, I mean, they still believe in the Trinity, I assume. So I'm not sure who, who's the second. I mean, if the son is Yahweh, I'm not sure what the father is. I, in fact, I've never... Can anybody explain that to me? But uh, traditionally, the father's Yahweh and Jesus is his son. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that it seems anachronistic when you already hold to a creedal consensus Trinitarian position within Christendom. 
and then you're reading the Gospels, you find elements of him being divine. It's easy for them to see and find ways to equate. That's why I run into these problems. He doesn't know the end, but he's equal with the father and only his father understands the end. I'm big into this apocalyptic thing because that's one of the reasons that it sealed the door shut for me is mm-hmm. finding out that it was expected. So my last question is, in in that vein of apocalypticism, I recently just interviewed John J. Collins two or three days ago, and we were talking about how the end did not happen. He looked at me like I was crazy because I asked him very basic questions that you would think a three-year-old would know. Like, what does heaven and earth mean? When he says heaven and earth will pass away, and he's like, heaven and earth. <laughs> and there are people, believe it or not, these preterists that I always bring to the table with you who think heaven and earth is a covenant term for God's covenant people, or the first covenant is a heaven and earth, which is the Mosaic covenant or some other redefinition. As you could see, this is what they do. So Mark 13, is that the end? Is the destruction of the Jerusalem temple the end? Or are these the signs that they expected the end would happen after these things would take place? Well, I, th- I think it depends what you mean by end. Mm-hmm. I mean, my sense is that in the Gospels, the idea is that the current order of things will be destroyed and that a good kingdom will come to earth. So there'll still be an earth. So the earth isn't going to blow up. Um, and that um, and that there will be humans here and that there will be life here. Um, and so what's being described, I think, is the destruction of the current order but it's not the end of the world in the the literal sense. Do you think it's fair to say that that current order is the Jerusalem temple, their priest, their, their setup and limiting it only to that? Or do you think that the end of the current order is literally a universal understanding of the earth and the problems within the world, et cetera, et cetera? The, the, the difficulty is that in these descriptions, you have the sun turning dark and the moon to blood and stars falling from the sky and if that is all literal, then literally the universe collapses on itself. Uh, so there's no place for a kingdom of God anymore. <laughs> uh, I don't think that Jesus talked about a new creation of the heavens and an, of the heavens and an earth. Uh, I think that in the book of Revelation, uh, you still actually still it, it calls it a new heavens and an earth, but it doesn't mean that the old one is destroyed. It means that the the powers that are in control are destroyed. And so my sense is that I think Jesus, I think Jesus was talking about the destruction of the current political order is going to be destroyed uh, and that it's going to have cosmic consequences because the forces of evil that empower these kingdoms will be destroyed. And so the cosmic, the cosmic destruction is, is symbolized by the, you know, the destruction of the sun, moon and stars. Um, But um, it's just a guess. He might've thought the whole universe is going to be destroyed and then God was going to like make a new, earth i don't i don't i really don't know the answer to that but it's the problem with symbolism is that you know you can get lots of it and you get most of it but there some of the details usually don't add up and it's because symbols are not direct narrative you know linear descri- descriptions of things yeah yeah that's it's been this tug of war for me uh, tom mm-hmm. wright writes that it was fulfilled and john j collin thinks it wasn't no of course it wasn't yeah, I know. The destruction of Jerusalem is not what he's talking about. <laughs> I mean, that's clear. Just read what he says. It's not talking about the destruction of Jerusalem. He's talking about the destruction of the entire created order. But does the, the earthy, you know, the powers, the powers of this world. Um, and so, uh, you know, including the Roman Empire. And uh, so uh, it's not just the destruction of Jerusalem. You could see how someone would be confused, especially if they're not. It's confusing. Yeah, it's confusing. Yeah, yeah. It is. Dr. Ehrman, I'm excited for this debate. I can't wait to see what happens here. And uh, I will say I interviewed Mike Lacona. And at the end, I said, how bad do you think you're going to beat him? You know, and <laughs> he said, well, I'll tell you this. This was his words. And I'd love to get your words on this. His words were, well, I think I have better arguments than him. But nobody can beat Bart in a debate. Bart's way better at communicating. <laughs> yeah. Um, I don't think he has better arguments. arguments than me. I, I really don't. No, I don't. He doesn't. He doesn't. And, you know, if you, instead of like having everybody watch, you should, you should have a group of historians evaluate his claims that you can prove that Jesus was raised from the dead. You know, not, not Christian historians, just historians. Um, historians. Is this the sort of thing you can show? Just... Survey some historians, see what they say. Um, so um, 
Uh, what do I think? So my view of these debates is that everyone who is engaged in a debate, one on one, everyone who comes out of the debate thinks, "Man, I really crushed that guy." <laughs> you go out of the room saying that. The other guy saying the same thing. <laughs> yep. Right. So uh, we're we're in the Christmas season now, and one of the things that's obviously celebrated is Jesus' uh, birth to a virgin. Um, there are lots of elements of the Christmas story that are very much worth talking about, but this one is particularly intriguing for several reasons. Um, you find the virgin birth in the New Testament only in the Gospels of Matthew and Luke. Uh, the other two Gospels don't mention it, Mark and John, and it's nowhere else in the New Testament. The, of the 27 books of the New Testament, only two mention Jesus being born of a virgin, but it becomes a very central feature of Christianity and, and Christian doctrine. Uh, since, well, since, since the Enlightenment, some scholars have pointed out that there are other stories like that floating around in the ancient world, where somebody is, uh, somebody is born to the union of a divine being and a mortal being. In almost all these cases, you have a, a, a male divinity, a god, who comes down and gets a mortal being a woman pregnant. And so the child that's born then is the union of a immortal and immortal, both human and divine. Uh, and so what the question, so th these kinds of stories are circulating throughout the Roman world and you have a number of cases of the political figures, uh, ph philosophers, religious figures who are said to have a divine parent. And if you go on the internet, you'll see that these things are called virgin births, that, that the virgin birth of Jesus was you know, it was a, a common trope throughout the uh, throughout the Greek and Roman worlds that, that you have these divine fathers and mortal mothers. My question in this seminar is, were any of these women in these stories virgins? Uh, were they virgins? And uh, uh, if so, then are Christians just, you know, taking over this theme from others? If not, if they were actually weren't virgins, then why do Christians come up with this, the idea of a virgin birth? Um, why, why do they tell that story as opposed to some other kind of story about the miraculous? So that's that's what the webinar is about. I'm looking forward to that webinar, and of course, I hope everybody goes down in the description www.mythvisionpodcast.com forward slash virgins, plural. The link is there. So Dr. Ehrman, I'd like to focus on something that really has intrigued me. The earliest gospel consensus academics say is Mark. And if Mark is our earliest, why the heck doesn't Mark capitalize on the birth of Jesus from a virgin? Right. Well, it's a very interesting question, a really important question. Um, there will be scholars with different views, although I think my guess is the majority of scholars think that Mark didn't tell us anything about, about the virgin birth because he didn't know about a virgin birth, uh, that, that this is not uh, a story that, we, that he had heard yet. It's not clear whether the story had even come into being yet. Uh, it's, it's, it gets even more interesting than that with Mark. Because in Mark's gospel, um, you have a passage that you don't you don't quite get it this way in the other gospels. In Mark's in in Matthew, Luke, or John, in Mark's gospel, uh, a couple chapters later, after when Jesus Jesus in his ministry, a couple chapters into his ministry, he is um, uh, he's attracted this big crowd, and there's a lot of rumors going on around him. And we're told that his mother and his brothers come to rescue him from the public eye because they think he's gone out of his mind his mother. And so she doesn't seem to know who he is in Mark. And that that's often taken as an indication that in Mark's gospel, at least, there's not only not a virgin birth, but there's a question about whether Mark, I mean, Mark seems to be arguing against a virgin, not arguing against it because he doesn't know about it, but his gospel seems to presuppose there wasn't a virgin birth because because Mary doesn't seem to know who Jesus is. Wow. This is great information. I've always wondered that. And I want to make one mention. There's contemporaneous work to the Gospels. I'll say, give or take a few decades. Suetonius writes, actually, in Life's the Caesars. And I'm really impressed with his Augustus angle, because in this uh, documentation on Augustus, you literally hear not only of portents of his birth, there's like a prophecy where lightning struck a certain wall and these people fight against the Romans almost to their own self-destruction. But the Senate, and this is what's really interesting, catches word that this prophecy is going to be fulfilled in a certain year, 
So the mothers didn't want to rear up their children and put them in the census saying, hey, our kids are going to be born and they're going to kill these children if they find out that this might be one of them. That sounds a lot like Matthew. Do you think there's something going on here? Well, it sounds a lot like Matthew. It sounds a lot like Exodus. Same thing with the birth of Moses. Um, they're actually it's it's um, it's a, uh, a trope in uh, in ancient literature that uh, that the the great man uh, had a lot of troubles to begin with and almost didn't make it out of infancy. <laughs> and so and so you have these kind of divine interventions to uh, to make it happen. And so you get the divine intervention in the in the birth often, but then also in the early protection of the child. And so I don't think Suetonius is getting this from Matthew. I think this is this trope that you get in in other uh, in other contexts, including, I mean, even in the ancient Near East, the birth of Sargon the Great has also a similar kind of story, the, the uh, king of, of Assyria. And so, uh, yeah, so I think it is a trope. And it is interesting that you get this uh, spectacular birth of Augustus in Suetonius and that, you know, it's part of part of the trope. I must ask you your thoughts on this. I watched your debate, the long debate on the resurrection with Mike Lacona and you. And there was a moment during the debate where I felt like maybe Mike was wiggling in his seat a little and you were getting a little hype. And I loved that because it's fun to see this go on with academics. And you said, there are so many other stories of other people. And I think you mentioned virgin births or miraculous births. And my, and I don't want to get caught up on whether they're virgins or not, because your course is going to get into this. But the point I do want to mention is this seems to be kind of an Achilles hill, in my opinion, when the Christians set up a creed that demands you believe this is a virgin birth and that you need to believe that in order to be a Christian. But we have all these other stories, whether they're virgins or not. Don't you see there's a, a huge flaw on be, being not consistent toward other narratives that are speaking about other gods or demigods, you name it. Well, I think I think the consistency is the issue. I mean, I don't think that there that it's necessarily an Achilles heel for Christianity that you have these other stories floating around because there there are ways that uh, that you can explain that if you're a theologian and have. I mean, you know, I mean, C.S. Lewis, for example, is an apologist, not a theologian, but a, who, who C.S. Lewis claimed somewhat famously that that you have and he's actually borrowing this from Justin Martyr from the second Christian century who the, our first apologist that that you have kind of foreshadowings of what's going to happen in with with when God comes into the world in other religions because religions aren't all completely false they're also claims of truth in other religions that are actually true and so they have reflections of what's going to happen with Jesus and so you know you can get around these things uh, on a theological level the problem is the historical level, uh, which is the one you're talking about. If someone like an apologist, like Michael Lacona, wants to say, we've got proof of Christianity, here it is, it's bam, 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 and the exact, not the exact same things, but the, the parallel thing, the exact parallel things can be claimed for other gods and other humans, then why is it proof for Christianity and not for these other things? I mean, when you come to a suppose so when you come to a miraculous birth, okay, I'm going to claim that um, that God uh, was my was my literal father, uh, and I'm going to claim that, and my followers are going to believe me, and they're going to convince other people. How are you going to convince somebody that your father actually was God? I mean, you know, is it that your mother's going to say, "Oh, yeah, I actually never had sex," you know, or "Yeah, I didn't want to," but you know, this God came down and you know had His way with me, and you know, and so the what it's based on what the woman says. Well, okay, is that evidence? I mean, suppose Mary. Some people say, "Look, the only way the gospel writers could have gotten it is if Mary told them, and so it had to be right." Well, okay, so today. If there's a woman who gives birth and she says, look, I never had sex before, really, trust me. It's like, I, I, I'm not married. I never had sex. And she gives birth. Do you, do you think, oh, well, that's evidence then. Okay, yeah, she never, she never had sex. <laughs> of course not. <laughs> you, you say, yeah, okay, I think you had sex. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, so what, what kind of evidence would be that, you know, if somebody could cite for the virgin birth, what, what would be the evidence that you 
that would be different from the evidence that Romulus I mean, was born of a virgin or Alexander the Great or, you know, or any of these others who are who I'm not conceding right now are born of a virgin, by the way. I am saying they were said to be born uh, miraculously with the divine father. And that's not the same as the woman being a virgin. And I understand that every narrative of every God is unique and special in its own way, but there's also differences, there's similarities. So I think that that's also this like cop out thing that apologists use is to say, this is so unique. And it's like, they're all unique and different. And there's always something special about them. Yeah, that's exactly right. So you have, you have apologists, you know, they'll, they'll take, you know, five divine men from the ancient, five sons of God, and who are doing miracles, you know, they do this, 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 this. And then they'll say, yeah, but Jesus is different because he does that, you know, and so, so Jesus really is different, you know, or people ascending to heaven, you know, well, the, 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 yeah, but Jesus is different because of that. And it's true, Jesus is different because of that. But if you put the, if you've got five other divine men, if you put the pile, have six, including Jesus, and you take one of the others out, you could do the same thing. Oh, yeah, those others, including Jesus, this is, but this person is that, you know, and, and so everybody's different. So it doesn't, you know, but I don't know why apologists who want to argue objectively for the, for the historical truth and use logical argument, I don't understand why they don't understand logic. <laughs> but some don't. The idea of philosophy, I have found from reading books like Francesca Stavrakopoulou's book, which takes Yahweh and places him in his ancient Near Eastern context, where she spends multiple chapters talking about God's penis. I mean, like the physical body of the deity. Over time, though, we find Plato comes in and the impact of the philosophers in the Mediterranean world. There seems to be this trickle down effect where they're kind of even sh like, ooh, hold on. Um, Zeus did what? Uh, no, that must mean something else. It's an allegory or a metaphor or something. Yet they still hold on to the idea that the gods um, have children. And my question, zeroing in specifically on Jesus, is this. He's called son of God in Mark. How can he be a son of God if he isn't born? At least Matthew's narrative is trying to say Hey, the panuma, which is a whole nother thing I think your course will probably get into, is what births Jesus and Mary as a virgin um, using the Septuagint, which is a whole nother sidetrack. But the question is, why is he a son of God in Mark if he isn't birthed by God in Mark? Um, so um, it's a very good question and a very important question, because to understand what Mark means, uh, it's important to understand what the term son of God meant in the Roman world. Uh, at the time. Um, son of God was a term you, in familial relationships. You would be, you could be the son of somebody if, uh, if they were your biological parent or if they adopted you. Um, and so that's why, um, that's why Octavian could claim to be the son of uh, Julius Caesar, who, had, who was declared a god, and so he could declare himself the son of God. Um, within the, apart, from, apart from the theological things about sons of God, it's important that within family relationships, the, um, the upper elite people who were adopting people, if you were adopted in the ancient world by an elite person, you were normally adopted as an adult. So they're not adopting a baby and raising them. Oh, they probably do that sometimes. But, but like Julius Caesar adopted an adult or well, an older boy, uh, Octavian, to be his to be his son. Um, Julius Caesar had another son uh, 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 with with Cleopatra. <laughs> he and Cleopatra uh, had a child, um, Caesarian, who uh, was his biological son. But being the biological son was not as important as being the adopted son. The adopted son became Caesar Augustus. Caesarian, whom you've probably never heard of, became a nobody. <laughs> uh, the adopted son was the one who was given all the status, the power, the, the money, everything. Uh, and so being an adopted son was a big deal, and you're still considered the son. Jesus is the son of God uh, in Mark, probably because he's the adopted son of God. Uh, I don't know what it is, but when we talk, People are watching. Uh, maybe it's your personality. Maybe you just you just say it like it is, and it sometimes gets a lot of attention. I think it's my stunning good looks. <laughs> uh, 
I'll let you have it. I'll let you have it. Uh, <laughs> I have a fantastic fan of Myth Vision who really appreciates your work, and he made this episode possible. But I want to give a plug. You've got a Paul and Jesus course coming out. Can you tease our audience with what that is and what they might expect? Yeah, well, you know, um, most people think of Christianity as the religion based on the death and resurrection of Jesus. And that's certainly Paul's view. Paul's entire, his entire point is that you may right with God by believing that Jesus died for your sins and was raised from the dead. Um, the question is, is that what Jesus taught? Uh, when you look at our earliest sources for Jesus, it appears that he teaches that there's a kingdom of God that is coming soon, that God will destroy the forces of evil and bring in a utopian place for his followers. And that means you want to be one of his followers, which means... If you're sinning, you need to repent and turn back to God so that he will forgive your sins. And you can then uh, you can live, you can start living differently. You can live for God. You can live for others. Love your neighbors yourself so that you'll enter the kingdom. And so if that's right, if Jesus is right, that he's teaching love of God, love of neighbor, enter the kingdom. How can Paul be, be saying the same thing when he says, no, no, you've got to believe in the death and resurrection of Jesus? Is that the same thing or is it completely different? Or are there, is there continuity between them? And so I play this out in a course of eight lectures, uh, 30 to 40 minute lectures each, where we play out what Jesus was teaching, what Paul is teaching, and then comparing, is this similar, the same, or different? Bart, I look forward to seeing you there. I'm, I'm actually helping put that thing together with you. And I, I know for a fact that this course is going to be a game changer for anyone who's serious about learning the origins of Christianity, who Paul is, what Paul's teaching, who Jesus was, what Jesus taught. So be sure to sign up. Myth Vision will be there. I'm going to go ahead and jump into these questions from our fan, an anonymous fan. Scholars from many nations have contributed to the advent of critical biblical scholarship since the discipline began in earnest during the Enlightenment. However, it is safe to say those academics based in Central Europe, especially in German regions, have provided a disproportionate number of scholarly discoveries and advances from the time of Reimarus to the present. Even Gerhard Kittel, who became a notorious supporter of the Nazi regime, regime sorry, co-edited a multi-volume New Testament theological dictionary still in use today. Dell Allison, in his Myth Vision course, The Quest for the Historical Jesus, devoted four of his eight lectures to German and Swiss luminaries. Do you have any thoughts on why this development occurred? Could it be the Reformation followed by the religious conflicts culminating in the Thirty Years' War? weakened the influence of church control and dogma over scholarship while enlightened rulers as epitomized by the flute playing skeptic frederick the great of prussia fostered universal education and academic inquiry can i just say yes <laughs> uh, it, you know it is a very interesting phenomenon that uh that you know people spend a lot of time thinking about uh, when I was in graduate school in the uh, in the 70s and in the early 80s, we always talked about we always called German the biblical language. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we had to learn, of course, German and French, but but as part of our research. But you know, all the all the hard all the serious scholarship, not all of it, a lot of the really serious scholarship was in German, and so you had to learn German well enough to be able to read the books and the articles, and. Uh, and I would say that it is pretty true that up until probably, well, into the 20th century, most of the really hardcore stuff was in German. There were some in French and there were some in English. English. Uh, and so for a long time, it was kind of Germany uh, and, you know, and G German speaking areas and uh, England, uh, somewhat France and then somewhat America. Now, it's completely changed, though, I would say. I'd say it's completely changed. I would say America really is more at the forefront and then and then Germany and other play and England and England. Uh, and so those three are the kind of the big spots, uh, even in other places in Europe, not so much France and, and Italy and stuff. And it's no accident, I think, that those are the three areas that were uh, that w had a very strong Protestant influence. And it is it does go back to Martin Luther. I mean, once you once you say that the sole authority for uh, for for understanding our world and understanding God and understanding salvation, the sole authority is the Bible. 
uh, not church authority. Once you say that, you better start studying the Bible. And so the, uh, the influence of, uh, of Protestantism uh, pl played, played the role of significance, but so much so that, I mean, even into the early 20th century, when Albert Schweitzer writes his quest of the historical Jesus, which is the German's von Reimarus zu Vreda. So from, from this figure Reimarus, to Vreda, uh, two German scholars, one writing in 17, published in 1770s, the other published in 1901. <laughs> that period, <laughs> it's like, Schweitzer says like, it's all German, baby. <laughs> he, he, mentions, he mentions, you know, a, a couple of French people, a couple, you know, but basically it's German. And he says, only Germans could have done, he says this, only Germans have the mentality to do this. And so that's, yeah, so that's, that's a large, a large part of it is because of the Protestant Reformation. Thank you. What is the pseudo-Clementine literature, specifically the homilies and recognitions, and how important are they to New Testament scholars, Dr. Ehrman? Uh, well, I'll answer the second part first. To most New Testament scholars, they're not important at all, because my guess is 98% of New Testament scholars have never read them. <laughs> <laughs> and probably, I bet the majority could not define them. <laughs> That's what I would say. I, I certainly couldn't when I finished my PhD. <laughs> no way. So, um, pseudo-Clementines. So, uh, these are the two most important works, the recognitions and the homilies. They are better known now than they were in the early 80s. Scholars have gotten more familiar with them. They're called the pseudo-Clementines because they are about and allegedly by Clement of Rome. Clement of Rome was one of the early uh, bishops of Rome in uh, tradition, uh, the third or fourth bishop, depending on how you count. Um, he uh, allegedly was converted by the apostle Peter himself. And the pseudo-Clementine writings are called pseudo-Clementines because people now realize, realize he didn't write them, but they claim to be, to be written by him. They are two versions of the same basic story, which is about Clement's conversion and then is accompanying Peter on his missionary journeys. Um, and, uh, and so they're, they're leg highly legendary accounts. They are long uh, and um, when I was in graduate school, they were registered as one of the most complicated areas of scholarship in early Christianity uh, because the only thing that people wanted to talk about, this is mainly rooted in German scholarship, was the, uh, the, um, the Ur text behind these two. These are two versions of the same story. And so what scholars were incessantly trying to do, you know, the four scholars in the world who were interested in doing this, what they wanted to do was figure out what the original text was that these two are offshoots of, and then to see what that would be useful for in, for historical purposes. So anyway, that's what they are, the pseudo-Clementines. They, they, they date from the fourth or fifth century. They're forged, um, but they're very interesting. One reason they might be interesting to some New Testament scholars is because they, um, they do appear to present uh, a, a view of Peter as being far superior to Paul and Paul being a problem. <laughs> Not the great apostle that we all have come to know and love, but being a heretic. That that was probably the one part I was hoping you'd mention. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> well, there's one, there's one pseudo-Clementine that the person didn't ask about that's, that's a preface to the homilies that is allegedly, allegedly a letter by Peter to James, the, uh, the, the head of the church in Jerusalem, where Peter um, tells, warns James against another figure who is, uh, who is converting Gentiles to, with a lawless gospel. And Peter, allegedly Peter says, this man is my enemy. And it's clear as day, he's talking about Paul. So this is a forged letter saying that Paul was Peter's enemy. Real quick question on that before we move on is, I can't imagine they pulled all this out of the air. I, when I'm reading the New Testament, I did not even read the homilies, the recognitions. I see some strife. I mean, it clearly spelled out that he confronts Peter, but but beyond that even, it sounds like Paul makes little jabs here and there. So the question I have is, do you think that this, I mean, there is a obviously an agenda on the author's behalf to really downplay Paul, probably for other reasons that aren't related to first century, but do you think that they're also pulling this from the New Testament? 
Uh, to some extent, yeah. I think I think the conflict between Peter and Paul in the New Testament is not really about what we would think of as the essence of the Christian message that the death and resurrection of Jesus brings salvation. I think they both completely agreed on that. That Jesus, I think they agreed that Jesus' death was an atonement for sins, and you have to believe in his death and resurrection. Where they disagreed is it's principally in the book of Galatians that we learn about it. And there the disagreement is that, that Peter and Paul draw different uh, implications from this message. They both agreed the Gentiles and Jews could be followers of Jesus. But Peter was more the persuasion that it meant that, that Jews could maintain their Jewish identity distinctively from Gentiles, which would be affect their behavior within the Christian community because Jews and Gentiles would have to be somewhat segregated, at least some of the time, for Jews to keep their Jewish identity. And Paul thought that was completely anathema, that in fact, Jews and Gentiles were equal in Christ and there can be no separation of any kind. That was their conflict. Um, the author of the Pseudo-Clementines um, and the tradition standing behind the author appear to have been more favorable toward the idea of a Jewish Christianity that maintained some kind of Jewish identity. Um, and we're keeping the Jewish law mattered. And so he was more on Peter's side of that, and he championed Peter, Peter for that reason. And he's getting it, you know, the traditions go back to the New Testament already to Paul, but uh, I think the tradition lived on even apart from the New Testament. Thank you, Bart. How have the discovery of the Ugaritic texts impacted scholars' understanding of the evolution of Yahweh? from a storm or mountain volcano deity to one acquiring some of the characteristics of surrounding Canaanite gods, including temporarily possessing a consort. What is the Kenite Midianite hypothesis? Right. <laughs> that was my real expertise, Ugaritic. <laughs> um, so the, this is a very long story that I'm not going to get into because I'm not much of an expert. Um, Ugaritic is a, um, is a Semitic language that's very similar to, to Hebrew. And it, when, it, when the Ugaritic texts were discovered uh, well over 100 years ago, at the end of the 19th century, uh, it was recognized that they could be useful in unpacking uh, the Hebrew language because um, when, you're, when you're dealing with Hebrew, the language of Hebrew, it's complicated because the only ancient Hebrew text you've got, biblical Hebrew text you've got, th that kind of Hebrew, is found in the Bible. So it's not like the New Testament, which is written in Greek, but is where you've got you know thousands of Greek texts to look at to see what words mean, <laughs> and to look at where ideas came from, because you got all these thousands of texts. These Hebrew, the Hebrew text, that was it for the Bible. So that's the, that's the Hebrew that you've got to, to figure out what the words mean. But now you've got the you started finding these comparable languages, these cognate languages like Ugaritic. So you can figure out, you know, what the word cucumber meant, you know, or something. Yeah. <laughs> and so, and so, um, so that it was good for that. But it was also what was stunning about it is that these Ugaritic texts um, also contain stories comparable to those found in, in the Hebrew Bible, especially a creation account that sounds very much like, in, in some ways, using similar words and similar concepts to what you get in the, in the creation account. Um, this, the Ugaritic findings were part of kind of a larger phenomenon going on at the end of the 19th century where they found, uh, where they found texts, uh, where uh, you've, got, you've, you've, got cre a cre you've got creation stories and flood stories, for example, including Canaanite texts. Uh, and in some of, these, some of these ancient Near Eastern texts, you've got this like chief god who has a uh, has a female companion, and scholars have thought that Asherah in the Old Testament, who is a goddess that's worshipped uh, in in, uh, in in Israel, Baal and Asherah are both worshipped, uh, and so the idea is that they they Asherah is the consort, and some people have thought that um, that Yahweh uh, was understood within Israel like Christians and have Asherah as a consort, and they find evidence actually in the Hebrew Bible itself. And so the significance of this kind of finding, not just the Ugaritic, but also the Canaanite and other in Egyptian, ancient Near Eastern stuff, is that it helps put these biblical con uh, ideas into context and it helps you realize 
gives you kind of a fuller understanding of what it means. Uh, and so in one case, it might mean that there were Israelites who thought that, that Yahweh was married. <laughs> so that's <laughs> important. <laughs> Makes sense. And then I guess the last was just the Midianite Kenite hypothesis. Uh, from what I understand, and then you might want to fill in the gaps, is somewhere down in in, in the south uh, of Southeast Asia there, uh, near Arabia slash modern day Palestine, where we're looking today, um, this God emerges out of like a nomadic tribal people, this God emerges. And because we have certain implications in Exodus and other places where it sounds like the father-in-law where Moses discovers this God who's not named Yahweh before is now being named Yahweh, but your fathers didn't know me as this, but now they know me, that maybe this tradition comes out of this area and the Midianite deity, that Yahweh might have been a Midianite deity. Uh, fill me in, correct me. Is this, am I on the right track? Uh, yeah, there, um Yes, I mean, you are. And it, it's a complicated issue because we don't, it's not like we've got um, extra textual evidence that can help us very much on this. You right. know, they haven't found a huge cache of uh, Kenite texts. <laughs> and so this is largely based on an analysis of the Pentateuch where it's recognized that within the Pentateuch, you have different strands of tradition. The, the thing from the 19th century that many people still kind of basically hold to is the JEDP theory, the four document hypothesis. And the deal is, is that within these, these four, these appear to be four different sources sprung up different times, different places were based on earlier oral traditions. And you have this account in, um, in Exodus, where uh, Moses is given God's name as Yahweh, and he's told that that you know no one has known him as Yahweh before, but now he's revealing it to him, which is a little bit confusing because when you read the book of Genesis, God reveals his name Yahweh to Abraham <laughs> yeah. hundreds of years earlier, and Yah and Abraham calls him Yahweh, <laughs> and so he's like, oh <laughs> wait a second, and so the theory is that the that one of these Pentateuchal sources had its roots in this region of Midian because uh, Moses' Moses's father-in-law, who's um, given two different names <laughs> in the Old Testament, <laughs> what is it, Jethro and Ruthiel or something, uh, that the, the two names come from two different sources and the Moses tradition come from two different sources and that one of these sources is different from the source of Genesis and that the one source that has this kind of Kenite, Midianite thing is a source that goes back from there. And so in order to say, though, that Yahweh arose as that divinity, you'd have to say that that's the source that's preserving a historical recollection more than the source that's recording that Abraham got this thing in Canaan. See what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And so... Uh, so it's one of the theories that Yahweh arose there as opposed to somewhere else. Thank you. Despite searches in the Sinai over many years, no credible archaeological artifacts have been found supporting the Old Testament Exodus story. Yet many believers argue the time interval from at least 1250 BCE to the present has destroyed such evidence. However, the 1996 discovery of a Bronze Age battlefield site next to the Tolentz River in northeast Germany dated to between 1300 and 1200 BC and involving a few, far fewer people has already yielded over 13,000 artifacts. Since northern Europe's climate is generally less hospitable to the preservation of artifacts than the Sinai, is this not an additional talking point to assert the biblical exodus never occurred? Could you uh, which remind which modern discovery were, were they referring to that's going to matter? Uh, for Bronze me? Age battlefield site next to Tolentz River in northeast Germany, dated yeah, to yeah. between 1300 and 1200. So it's about the yeah. same time distance. Yeah, yeah, no, it's a good comparison. Yeah, no, th this idea, you get this, and even you know, even critical scholars will sometimes say, "Look, how could you have any remains? It all got wiped out." Uh, well, you know, did chariots, you know, get buried? Did, what happened to them? <laughs> they would still be around. Uh, and so um, there are, we, it's not just the thing in Germany. It's throughout, see, let me say several things. One thing is, in terms of remains, um, many people think that Egypt's the only place where anything's going to be remain because of the dry climate. And as it turns out, for most kinds of materials, especially organic materials, it doesn't matter if it's a dry climate or not. 
to survive thousands of years. What matters is that it has a consistent climate um, of humidity. It's the humidity level. And so, for example, there's this, you know, there's this uh, British army camp that was discovered in England where they found letters that these Roman soldiers wrote 2,000 years ago. It was in a bog. <laughs> bog, wow. yeah, because the humidity was constant. And so uh, the humidity, if the humidity goes up and down, then you then you forget it. <laughs> but if, if it's constant and so it isn't just like it isn't the amount of time, it isn't the dryness. It's like the consistency. And so but things like metal will survive, of course, in sand for, for basically forever. And so um, uh, there have been many discoveries of you just think about paleographic, uh, paleolithic art. Paleolithic, it still survives. So um, the point about the Exodus is absolutely right. There's no trace, including, by the way, in, in, the, in the Hebrew Bible, in the book of Numbers, basically most of the 40 years of Israel in the wilderness was at Kadesh Barnea, which is a, um, it's this place kind of south of, south of Israel that's, that was a, like an oasis, a big oasis. And boy, they dug around in that place and found nothing. The people were there for decades, <laughs> like eating off of plates, you know, and like sharpening swords and things. There's nothing. <laughs> so, yeah. And, and, you know, when I was a fundamentalist, we always heard that there are chariots at the bottom of the Red Sea. <laughs> you know, yeah, that's wrong. <laughs> and so there's, not, there's nothing in Egypt. There's nothing in the Sinai. There is nothing to suggest it. And I hope everybody knows you can go in the description and you can actually sign up for your Exodus course that you've done. So you definitely need to check out Bart Ehrman's course on that because he dives into this. Lots yeah, of fun. There are, actually, there are actually two courses. So I did one on Genesis, mm -hmm. uh, which deals with kind of the Pentateuch, but deals with Gen but the other is on Exodus through Deuteronomy. And yeah, this wilderness stuff, the Exodus, I get into all the histor historical business on that. Sign up today. What is your opinion regarding the authenticity of the James ossuary and the Talpiot tomb? Do you believe either or both provide evidence for the existence of Jesus and his family line? No, I don't think so. I know that uh, my friend James Tabor very much thinks so. And um, I assume that there are other other scholars who do, although I don't think I know, know of any others. I, I know a number of archaeologists who don't give it any credence at all. Um, famous, famous, art, I mean, you know, Eric Myers, um, um, Jody Magnus. I mean, just, you know, people, you know, they, they think that these are not, these are not ancient artifacts. Thank you. Do you think the early Jewish Christians of the Jerusalem church, rather than Paul, had a better understanding of Jesus, his message and aims? Certainly during the early years, there must have been some in this movement who actually knew Jesus and heard him preach. Few, if any, followed Paul as far as we know. Uh, yeah, I think that's probably right. Uh, I mean, James was Jesus' brother. <laughs> he was the head of the church. Uh, Peter was his right-hand man. John was a pillar of the church. Those people spent time, a long time with Jesus. And I think they probably did have a better understanding of the historical Jesus. Um, their conflict with Paul, though, doesn't appear to have been about their understanding of the historical Jesus um, or about their understanding of his death and resurrection. Their big differences with Paul had to do with the relationship of Jew and Gentile. And that was something Jesus probably never talked about. Wow. So it might have overshadowed a lot of the other stuff. There was so much conflict. Well, certainly did eventually. I mean, to, I mean, Christianity was was about the death and resurrection of Jesus, but that but that conflict that conflict was really uh, Paul thought it was the biggest. He thought it was the biggest thing that ever hit the planet. This conflict about whether I mean, he thought the Galatians were going to lose their salvation if they would get circumcised, and he he blamed the Jerusalem apostles. But he but he didn't. You know, that was his opinion. I'm not sure they thought it was that important. They just thought, yeah, that's not our view. <laughs> they agreed on the death and resurrection of Jesus, though. Why do you think early Jewish Christians objected to eating meat sacrificed to idols, as mentioned, for example, in Galatians? Was it because they believed such a sacrifice would allow demons to enter the meat, infect those who ate it, as well as those non-eaters who were nearby, like a virus? 
Uh, it's not Galatians. It's First Corinthians chapters eight and ten, and uh, also in the Book of Revelation. Um, we're not told what the objection is. Um, there are hints about it. Um, the hints about it suggest that um, some people think that this meat. So the meat. So the way it works is this. It, it's kind of there's kind of a long backstory. I won't give the whole thing, but the basic story is that in the ancient world you couldn't go to the butcher and buy your meat or the grocery store. the The animals that are that are killed are being slaughtered, and they're being slaughtered to sacrifices in pagan ritual. And so the worship of God would often involve sacrificing an animal to the God, and the the animal uh, then the the, the fat and the bones would be burned, and the, the the smell would be, that's what the gods liked. And then the humans would keep the meat, and they'd have a party, and they'd eat the meat. But then there'd be meat left over, or the meat would be given to the temple, or the, the priest sold the meat. And so if you ate meat, uh, usually it meant that it had been sacrificed to a pagan god. And so the question about that is, you know, how does that, um, so how does that fit in? And um, the... One idea. So it looks like it, it looks like in First Corinthians, in the city of Corinth, there are people saying who are saying there are two groups. One group is saying, "Look, the pagan gods don't exist. They might think that they're sacrificing this thing to a god. There's no god. <laughs> so they've got this. They've got this statue of wood. They sacrifice it in front of us. So what? It's just meat. <laughs> and so they say, of course we can eat the meat. And there are other people who are saying, "Look, this is sacrifice to a pagan deity. If you participate in this." You are participating in pagan sacrificial rituals, and so you're you're giving approbation to pagan practices. You can't do that. Other Christians said you can't do that because they said, yes, those are not gods; they're demons, and you're participating in demon worship. And so, so there's a variety. There are a variety of views about this within the Christian community. Um, it's not clear that it was Jews against Jewish Christians against. Gentile Christians, it might have been. Uh, it might have been that uh, Jewish. It might have been that Jewish Christians were concerned that the um, that the food hadn't been sacrificed since it hadn't been sacrificed in the correct way. It was was not kosher. Um, that might have been, been a thing. I don't know that there's any evidence that demons were entering into the meat and infecting people through that. It's an interesting idea, but I don't know that there's much. Uh, much to say for it. I don't, or, or maybe against. Uh, we don't. We don't really know. Um, but Paul does say in First Corinthians ten that he's kind of debating the matter, and he basically ends up saying, "Yeah, yeah, I don't want you participating in the worship of demons." And so don't even <laughs> me. Thank you. Who were the Despoisini? I, I'm trying here. And do you think they may have formed a dynasty in the early Jerusalem Church? How do you it spell? Would, it? Huh? How do you spell the word? D E S P O S Y N I. Despasini. It would beat returning to Galilee and resuming a subsidence lifestyle. What do you think happened to them during the Jewish War 66 to 70? So it's this idea of a, they formed a dynasty in the early Jerusalem church. Uh, Disposini, if I know. <laughs> I, have no idea. I don't know. I don't know what that word means, disposini. It sounds like a Greek word. DYS would mean bad. Posini, posse. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what the person's referring to. Maybe um, one day we'll come back to it. Uh, what are the Codex Fuldensis and San Galensis, 1395, and what importance do they have for scholars? What? My my PhD exams here. <laughs> what? <laughs> I know, I know. Do you okay. do you have a rec any recollection of these particular? You know, I know full dance. I I should know Sangalensis because I think I used it in my dissertation <laughs> forty five years ago. Um, full dance is an important Latin manuscript that is a um, uh, it's a, a gospel harmony. That some people think is dependent on um, Tatian's Diatessaron, uh, or that somehow it's related to the Diatessaron, or more likely it's just another case where. Uh, so, a, a, a harmony is where you take the four Gospels and you take the stories in each one and you combine them all so that you end up with one big Gospel. Um, that's what the Diatessaron was done by Tatian in the second century. And it was. Um, he, he was a Syriac uh, Christian who studied with Justin Martyr 
in the uh, middle of the second century in Rome. And uh, he made this diatessaron. It's not clear if he did it, what language he did it in, if he did it in Greek or if he did it in Syriac. But it became, it got translated in Syriac or written in it, and it became the standard version of the Gospels in Syria for centuries. So they didn't have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They had this thing. And Codex Fodensis is kind of like that. It's a, it looks like it's a, a Latin version of a, of a gospel harmony of some kind. Um, so that's, that's what that is. Sangalens is I'm drawing a blank. Sorry. Uh, no biggie. No biggie. It says, what is Codex, the Codex Clara Montanus? And what is it its importance to scholars studying the Western type text? Okay. So, um, Codex Clermontanus is uh, what people call Codex D. Um, it is a uh, fifth century text. It's, it's one of the most studied texts of, uh, uh, the, of Greek, Greek New Testament scholars because it's fairly early. It's one of our earliest texts. It's one of our most complete texts, and it's one of our most bizarre texts. It is a Greek-Latin um, Book. So it's it's a diglot. It's got a Greek on one side of the page and Latin on the other side of the page, and it's so it has the four Gospels and act, and Acts, and um, and so you have you know you've got Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and Acts in in two columns, and it's a bizarre manuscript because it has a lot of um, textual readings. It has lots of ways of wording verses that is completely different. From other manuscripts <laughs> and so um the big question has been historically is it just aberrant uh by an aberrant scribe or is it standing in an ancient uh tradition that is aberrant or is it standing in an ancient tradition that in fact shows that every all these other manuscripts are aberrant <laughs> wow. and so uh and it has some really interesting textual variants uh in it uh, it has been much written about by their scholars have written entire books on it, uh, a number of really important books on it um, that deal with various aspects of it, including, for example, a classic work by Eldon Epp that tried to show that in the book of Acts, at least, the manuscript is, has an anti-Jewish bias, for example. Wow. Thank you for that. What is the Johannine comma and when did it first appear in a manuscript? <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, so in, uh, in grammatical terms, a comma is not just a punctuation mark. Our punctuation mark, the, our comma, the punctuation mark in English, separates off a, a kind of a sense unit that is shorter than a sentence, for example. Um, or so, it's, it's, it's shorter than something you'd use a semicolon for. Okay. So in Greek, when they talk about a comma, or a colon, they're not talking about the punctuation mark, they're talking about the sense unit. Like, uh, so if I have a phrase, for example, um, you know, uh, whatever phrase. So the Johannine comma is a unit of text in 1 John chapter 5, verses 7 and 8. Um, it is the passage that is the only passage in any of our manuscripts of the New Testament that appears to, uh, to affirm explicitly the doctrine of the Trinity. In 1 John chapter 5, um, the author of 1 John, whoever he was, says in the context of a discussion that there are three that bear witness, the Father, let's see, the Father, the water, and the blood. Okay, he's just talked about how about Jesus attests to the water and the blood. It may be a reference to in the Gospel of John when his side is pierced, water and blood come out. And so he says the water and the blood bear witness. And so first John is saying there are three that bear witness, the father, the water and the blood. And that's what it says in almost all the Greek manuscripts. When Erasmus produced his first edition of the Greek New Testament in 1516. It was the first time anybody had printed a copy of the New Testament on a printing press, as opposed to somebody writing it out by hand. When you write it out by hand, it's a manuscript. When you do it on, a print, on the printing press, then it's a printed text. Erasmus 
was didn't have very many manuscripts to base his text on, and he printed First John chapter five without those with, just with those words. There are three that bear witness: the Father, the, uh, the the water, and the blood. In the Latin tradition, uh, in the Latin Bible, in the manuscripts, the thousands and thousands of Latin manuscripts, and in the Latin printed Bible, the the Bible that had been used in the Western church, the Roman church for centuries and centuries had an additional line. There are three that bear witness um, in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Spirit, and these three are one. And there are three that bear witness on earth, the Father, the, the blood, and the water, and the blood. So this phrase, there are three that bear witness in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Spirit, and these three are one, that's the Johannine comma. And it's a, it was a controversial issue because Erasmus in the first Greek version didn't include it because it wasn't in his Greek manuscript. But many, many, many people objected on the grounds that Erasmus had eliminated the Trinity from the New Testament. And Erasmus pointed out, it's not in the Greek manuscripts. <laughs> but uh, they finally found some manuscripts that uh, incorporated, that they found that was actually from about the time that he was, he was doing his editions. Somebody was copying out the Greek manuscript and included it in Greek. And he ended up including it in a later edition of his Greek, the printed edition of the Greek New Testament. And that later printed, that later printed edition of Erasmus's New Testament uh, was the basis, ultimately the basis for the King James version of the New Testament. And so that phrase, the Johannine comment, will be found in the King James version and in uh, conservative evangelical versions that will include it, even though textual scholars are unanimous. This baby did not belong there. His was added. <laughs> and so, yeah. Yeah. One more, Bart, and then uh, we'll uh, hope people will go sign up for your new course and all the courses that you have. But your Paul and Jesus is the latest. Due to similarities between Matthew and Luke, scholars have posited the existence of a lost sayings collection called Q, that the authors of both Gospels had access to and copied from. However, some scholars have argued these similarities can be explained if it is assumed Luke had access to both Mark and Matthew. Which position do you hold and why? So the first position is called the four document hypothesis. Um, and it holds that Matthew, Mark, and Luke have four written sources behind them. Mark was the first. I'm sorry. Mark was the first. Matthew and Luke both used Mark. Um, and so that's why many times Mark's wording, his stories, the sequence of his stories, word for word the same in places in both Matthew and Luke. It's because they were both copying him and sometimes changing one thing or another thing. But they're getting their Mark and stories from Mark. But they have a number of sayings that are not found in Mark, like the Beatitudes or the Lord's Prayer, etc. The idea is that they got them from this no, the source that no longer exists. Uh, a, a source that contained mainly sayings of Jesus, the scholars have called Q. Q is short for the German word Kvela, because German scholars developed this view. Kvela, the, the word Kvela in German just means source. This is the sayings source for Matthew and Luke. So Matthew, Mark, and Luke, have, you've got, you got Mark, you've got, you got, uh, you got Q, you've got uh, Matthew has a bunch of stories himself, that's M. Luke has a bunch of stories himself, that's L. So you got Mark, Q, M, and L, that makes up the three synoptics. Okay, that's the theory. That has been the dominant theory since the middle of the 19th century. Uh, there have been alternative theories, including many before that and many after, and one that is catching hold now, especially because of my friend Mark Goodacre, uh, with whom I completely disagree. <laughs> <laughs> Mark uh, follows the the um, um, the, far uh, hypothesis. The, the far hypothesis, which was taught by his. Far had a student who was Mark Goodacre's teacher, and so it kind of is that lineage. Um, so uh, Mark, Mark holds this Far hypothesis. Uh, the Far hypothesis is that um, that Mark was first. Matthew and Luke both used Mark, but that Luke used both Matthew and Mark. So that's why you have similarities. Um, that's why Matthew and Luke have a number of things in common that aren't in Mark, because Matthew put them in his gospel and Luke copied them from Matthew. So that's. 
Uh, that's, the, that's the theory. The virtue of that theory is, is a very strong virtue that cannot be taken lightly. It's that it eliminates a hypo hypothetical source. Right. And so Occam's razor would say, get rid of the hypothetical source. And uh, it's absolutely right. If you can get rid of a hypothetical source without creating bigger problems, baby, go that way. Uh, some of these, some of these solutions, this is called solutions to this problem. This is called the synoptic problem. How do you explain the relationships, the agree, the similarities and the differences among Matthew, Mark, and Luke? How do you do it? And some hypotheses are just crazily complicated. That you've got this source, it's copied, this hypothetical source is copied, that hypothetical source copied, that source, that source, that source, and then it came down to this, and there's a, you have these diagrams like, oh my god! And so you want to get rid of as many hypothetical sources as you can. The problem is that if you get rid of Q, you create huge problems that cannot, in my opinion, be solved very readily. It's a probability case, and so you have to judge which is more probable. Uh, but my view is that there are really good reasons for thinking that, Ma that Luke did not use Matthew. If you want some kind of obvious ones to begin with, they both have birth narratives and genealogies Look at their birth narratives and genealogies. Does it look to you like he got the Luke got them from Matthew? <laughs> They're all different. I mean, they have Jesus born of a virgin in Bethlehem, okay, and he's got a genealogy. That's nice. Look at them. They didn't even get him from Matthew. He got him from somewhere else, okay? So there's a lot of places where you have overlap where it's clear Luke's not getting him from Matthew, but there are bigger problems. One very big problem is um, that... Matthew and Luke often have the same sequence of their stories. This happened, then this happened, then this happened, then this happened. Matthew and Luke have that same sequence. That's always in stories found in Mark. Almost, all, almost always. Not, not completely. But almost always those are the stories you got in Mark. That would make sense. They're both copying Mark and they have different places for their, they have different, you know, they're following his outline. Okay, so that makes sense. The problem is when you have these sayings materials that are not in Mark, the sequences are different. So the Lord's Prayer comes at a different place in Matthew than, than in Luke. The Beatitudes come in different place from Luke. This parable here occurs here in, in Matthew, but there in Luke. And like so to imagine that happening, it doesn't always happen, but that's that's the regular pattern except in places where you can explain it. You know, the sayings of Jesus in Matthew and Luke about the t in the temptation, you know, man shall not live by bread alone. Those are in the same places in Matthew and Luke, even though those, that saying is not in Mark. But they're in the same place because Mark has the temptation narrative. He has a shorter version of it, and they're including the sayings in the temptation version. That's what sayings during his temptation. So, yeah, so you can explain, like, a lot of these similarities. But if they're... If Luke copied Matthew, why did he take just the things that are not in Mark to rearrange their sequence? Why did he do that? And how did he do it? Hmm. So I think what we often imagine is that somebody has a big desk in front of him and he's got three books in front of him. And these are like books, like, you know, with, written on both sides of the page. You open up like our books. And what Math Luke, what Luke's doing is he's copying Mark from his book. He cuts in the, and then he's copying Matthew. He says, oh, yeah. So if he's doing it, if he's doing it that way, then he's, he, he's reading Mark and he's reading Matthew at the same time. And, oh, they, they, they both have that story. Okay, I'm going to put that in the same place. Uh, okay, same story. I'll put that one in the same. Then he comes across something Matthew. Oh, that's not Mark. Oh, I'm going to put that somewhere else. Why? I mean, wh why does the Sermon on the Mount all of a sudden become like all over the place in, in Luke? I mean, why? Is, why? Um, but not only why, but how. Ancient scribes appear not to have desks. They wrote on their knees. How do you do that when you're copying two books at once? I, I really don't know. I mean, I don't, Is it I don't fair know. to say that the whole problem is way messier than any of these hypotheses are trying to maybe propose? My, my mentor in uh, graduate school was Bruce Metzger, very famous textual critic. And um, he always talked about the least problematic solution. <laughs> Which solution causes the, the fewest problems? 
And that's what, that's what happens in this case. Does Q cause fewer problems than uh, Luke copying Matthew? And I think the answer is a strong yes. It causes fewer problems. Mark thinks the Mark Goodacre thinks the opposite. So I'll say that that Mark's Mark Goodacre's views are uh, are starting to spread uh, because he's had he's had graduate students and he's convinced them, and so they're you know that's how it kind of works. Uh, but the majority of scholars still hold to Q. Um, most of them think it's it doesn't solve all the problems. But I'll, I'll, I mean I'll tell you one issue that. I mean, you know, Mark knows, Mark Goodacre knows everything about this. He spent like, you know, half of his life studying this issue. <laughs> so he's like, he knows everything. But, but there are complications that many people would not think about. And I'll just name one, one for you, which is this. Um, when we say that Matthew and Luke copied Mark, they didn't copy the same copy of Mark. They would have had different copies. And if they had different copies, the copies would have had different wording in places. Okay. So not only that, they didn't have our copy of Mark. When we do these comparisons of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, we're doing it out of a Greek New Testament that Greek scholars have composed based on the number of manuscripts of Matthew, number of manuscripts of Mark, number of manuscripts. And they say, well, this is probably what Mark originally wrote. This is probably what Matthew originally wrote. This is what Luke probably originally wrote. And then you compare them to see where they're similar and different. We'll solve the synoptic problem. But Matthew and Luke did not have our printed Greek New Testament version of Mark. They had different versions of Mark. They're different from each other and different from ours. So how can you even make that comparison? And so one of Mark Goodacre's arguments, common arguments is Matthew and Luke have this small agreement. They're called minor agreements. Mark has something else and Matthew and Luke have, they agree again, that shows that Luke used Matthew. It might show that. It might show that they both had a copy of Mark that's different from our Mark. Hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. There are like oh. there are so many problems like that that that's why you go with the least least problematic answer. Who do you think is the most formidable opponent against uh, Mark Goodacre's position defending Q? I was thinking of Kloppenborg, but w I'm curious because I'd love to maybe make a debate happen. Would you be interested? I don't know. I'm just throwing things out there. You know, I've got there are some things in New Testament studies that I really enjoy teaching at a very basic level that I really do not enjoy going into the weeds on. <laughs> I mean, for example, the chronology of Paul's life. You know, it's like, there are people who are just like, this is like they spend their lives. Oh God, where was he in August of the year 53? You know, that kind of thing. <laughs> and I'm thinking, oh my God, no. And, and, there are, and the synoptic problem is one of them. It's like, or the, the source of the pseudo-Clementines. Like, it's like, I've got these things. Like, I just do not want to get into, I, it would, to debate Mark. So, okay, so who's the most formidable opponent? I don't know. I think most people just don't, don't agree with him and don't even bother refuting him because they just think it's problematic. But Kloppenborg knows a lot about Q. Uh, I don't agree with a lot of his, you know, Kloppenborg has a theory I don't agree with on Q. Kloppenborg uh, is one of these people who thinks that, that you can show the various versions of Q. So you've got Q1, Q2, Q3, where you have these various, like this was the first edition of Q. This is the second edition. This is the third edition, which is very helpful for the Jesus seminar because um, his first edition of Q doesn't have any apocalyptic material in it. Mm. <laughs> and so that's convenient because that means that the earliest source about Jesus is not apocalyptic. Yeah, well, right. If you can divide out three levels of editing of a non-existent source, <laughs> that's kind of problematic for a lot of us. But Kloppenborg, yeah, he would be a very good one if he's willing to do it. I just don't know. I don't know people who even bother to argue for Q because most people just subscribe to it. Dr. Airman, if I may, Muslims believe a certain idea of Jesus. Christians believe a certain idea of Jesus. They both believe in a miraculous virgin birth, uh, they believe in this idea of a, Jesus is born from a woman, and somehow God intervenes and miraculously makes Mary pregnant. If I'm not mistaken, this is both of them. 
if I could say, because you're the historical Jesus guy, where, because we know where Christians are wrong. You and me have talked about this, and we're going to hear more of that come December 5th. But where do Muslims, in their view of Jesus, get things wrong? I've had a number of, I've, I've done a number of interviews recently with Muslim uh, uh, podcast on um, Muslim podcasts, and it's been great fun uh, because Muslims do uh, revere Jesus in many ways. Uh, they have views of Jesus that uh, in in the Quran that um, are not. Some are found. Some are comparable to what you get in the New Testament, and others are taken up from uh, early Christian legends. Um, and I think most Muslims don't realize that these, these, that the stories that you find in the Quran uh, can usually be found outside the Quran earlier uh, in Christian sources. And including, I think the one that most Christians would find um, problematic is that Muslims do not believe, the Quran says, that Jesus didn't really get crucified. He didn't really die. Uh, that it was somebody else who got crucified in his place. And um, and so that's yeah. Well, that would be something that I think I think historically uh, I think Jesus certainly got crucified. I think this is a historical certainty. Um, there are other studies in the stories in the Quran that will actually be one of which will be reflected in in my webinar. As it turns out, uh, about not this one, not about the virgin birth, but about Jesus as a young boy. Mm. The story in the Quran about Jesus as a boy making uh, a bunch of clay birds that he brings back to life not back to life, he brings to life. And this story is taken from the infancy gospel of Thomas, which is an account of Jesus escapades as a young boy <laughs> from the ages of five to 12. And so that's part of what I'll be discussing in my, uh, in my webinar is not just the stories of Matthew and Luke about Jesus' birth, but also stories outside the New Testament about his birth and his upbringing uh, and this one that got picked up in the Quran. So let me let me give them some benefit of the doubt because we're always critical here at Myth Vision, and I want to be nice. And I think one thing I have to value on the Islamic approach to Jesus is they see him as a man. Like there is something that is like, okay, whatever they want to think about miracles, at least they see him as a man and not God, right? Because now you're getting outside of this whole idea of Jesus being divine. It's it's kind of uh, more of a realistic view, if that makes sense, in some respects. Would you agree? Uh, well, yeah. I mean, he, they, <clears throat> Jesus is not God in uh, in Islam, and um, so uh, yeah, certainly more realistic in that. I mean, Jesus was certainly a man, and uh, and I think that the early Christians would agree that uh, Jesus was a man, and so this would be a, a point of, and he would agree that he was, the Christians would agree that Jesus was a prophet, which is what the Quran says, and so I think um, there are there are uh, places uh, of agreement, but I would also say that um, that saying that Jesus of Nazareth was a man is a like a, a useful commonality between Muslims and uh, and Christians is kind of a low bar, right? It's like, <laughs> it's like the, the only ones who are disagreeing are the mythicists, like, you know, it's so like, you know, really <laughs> That's your standard. That you know, like if you agree against the mythicists, you're doing pretty well. <laughs> <laughs> so okay, I was trying. I tried. I literally did. Um, I guess <laughs> we're gonna have to watch this webinar. I'm telling you because I feel like we're getting into some things that I really want to save for the lecture. So this is really all I was wanting to know is how right and how wrong are they? on trying to get the historical Jesus. I, I wonder if they've had, go ahead, go ahead. They don't have any access to the historical Jesus. The, the Quran has no access other than Christian storytellers. And so whatever the Quran has picked up is, uh, is from earlier Christian traditions or something that it's, they've come up on, it's come up on, on, on their own. That's true though of the later gospels of Christianity as well. You know, if you, have, if you have gospels from the fourth or fifth century, they are either based on earlier Christian traditions or they're stories that people have made up. And that's what I would say about the Quran as well. So when, when the Quran says something about Jesus that happens to be historically accurate, like he was a man, it doesn't provide any kind of independent verification of that. They're just basing it on early Christian stories. Um, and so, but it, it's interesting from a history of religion's point of view to see what early Muslims thought about Jesus. Uh, and just as it's interesting to see what early Christians said about Jesus, it doesn't mean that they were right or wrong. It just means it's interesting to see what they thought. 
So final question in the vein of who Jesus was, Reza Aslan, he's a well-known Muslim, but also he's written a book about the zealot. I think it's called Zealot, where he's writing about Jesus. And I, I love learning different ideas and flexing my thinking about could he have been this rebel leader? Could he have been this and that? But do you think that Reza's painting Jesus in the image he would like Jesus to look like, which might look more along the lines of Muhammad? Because Muhammad was kind of a warlord, military uh, prophet. And if Jesus was carrying a sword, <laughs> he kind of matches the Islamic caricature of Muhammad in the early conquest and such. Yeah. Uh, well, that's an interesting point. I don't think I've ever looked at it that way. I, I, uh, Race's book it was a bestseller. It's the, it's, the only, it's the first book ever that I know of about Jesus to be a number one bestseller in the New York Times bestseller list. And it's a very, it's, it's a written very well. And it's a very, it's a page turner. Um, I don't think it's at all accurate. And the, in, in terms of its overall portrayal of Jesus. And I think that the portrayal of him as a zealot like figure, he doesn't think he was like officially capital Z zealot, but he was somebody who believed in a military overthrow of the Roman world. That's not a new idea. And um, a lot of Christian scholars have said that. Um, and so I don't think it's necessarily influenced by his view of Islam, but it's an, it would be interesting to pursue. Um, I don't. Th I think Razor was generally trying to do a historical study. Uh, this view that Je Jesus was a revolutionary was the very first view put out by Jesus by somebody who approached the Gospels from a critical point of view in the 1770s. Mm. Uh, Hermann si Samuel Rimaras, uh in a, a posthumous published book on Jesus uh, argued this. And so it was the first critical book of the historical, the first book that Albert Schweitzer talks about in his history, history of research, The Quest of the Historical Jesus. It was Rimaras, his view that he's a revolutionary. Uh, Aslan resuscitates that view, but I don't think, you know, I'm not sure he, he knew that this was Rimaras. I don't know if he thought, knew this was Rimaras as you or not. So I'm not convinced that it necessarily is because it makes Jesus look more like Muhammad. Um, because the reason for Jesus being a, uh, a zealot-like figure for Aslan is because the promised land was given to Jews and the Jews should have land. That means they got to take it from the Romans. <laughs> mm. So it isn't really like, you know, it's not quite the same thing. Thank you so much, Dr. Ehrman. Everybody go right now. Join the webinar. You're going to see me there. Um, I'm going to be helping out probably in the chat Been talking to Chris. We're going to be trying to make sure that we can have riot control. You know, wow. I hear that there's lots of wars that happen in the comment section as you're chatting. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Good point. Yeah, I don't read them. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm glad you don't, because if you did, we wouldn't be able to get what you're going to be presenting. Yeah, and I don't have time, but it's while well, I'm doing it, but still, even so, yeah, I heard it was a little bit rowdy last time, so uh, <laughs> we'll see what happens. <laughs> can't please everybody, and you can't please most people. <laughs> exactly. That'll be at mythvisionpodcast.com forward slash Christmas, and that's Dr. Bart's webinar. Go sign up now. Thank you so much, Dr. Airman. Thank you. Appreciate it. Yeah, well, thanks. It's it's uh, called Paul and Jesus, the Great Divide. And the question is one that's been around among scholars for a very long time. You have this, um, you know, you've got the historical Jesus who is preaching his, uh, his message of uh, the coming kingdom of God and the need to repent because the kingdom is coming near and you want to enter into the kingdom. Uh, you need to turn back to God in order to uh, to enter into this kingdom. You need to start keeping his law the way God wants you to. So, and then, so that's the preaching of Jesus. You get it throughout the gospels of the New Testament. And then you come to Paul, who's preaching that the way to have salvation is through the death and resurrection of Jesus. And he hardly ever mentions Jesus' teachings. Uh, and when he does mention his teachings, he doesn't, you know, they're not central teachings to what Jesus appears to have taught. And so uh, the question is, um, are they, are they preaching the same religion? When you think of Christianity, Christianity is usually thought of as a religion based on the death and resurrection of Jesus. Well, is that what Jesus' own religion was about? Was that what he was preaching? And if not, then isn't Christianity uh, the religion about Jesus rather than the religion of Jesus? And if so, isn't Paul the one who 
kind of does that. It creates this this thing we call Christianity. So that that's that's the kind of issue that we're dealing with in the course. The relationship of Paul and G- Jesus, where, where they're similar, but also where they're very, very different. I've really enjoyed this question for a long time and learning from you and other academics. I want to take just a deep dive into some of this. I know you're going to go into the course extensively on this idea, but there have been several academics I've interviewed who kind of coined the phrase that Paul's kind of the creator, or maybe they won't use the word creator, but they'll say he is the originator of what we call Christianity. However, he has this weird list in 1 Corinthians 15 where he claims people before him supposedly were eyewitnesses probably visionary states or something, it uh, depends on who you're reading, of Jesus' resurrection, a resurrected Jesus. He also persecuted Christians, as you've mentioned elsewhere. So what is he persecuting them for? What is their message? Are they already preaching a death, burial, resurrection idea about Jesus? Or could this be something different? And that Paul, as he says in Galatians 1, He receives this gospel through revelation, not of man, but directly from Christ. I don't know the answer, (laughs) but that's why I'm interviewing you to get you to tease us for your course, because I'm sure you're going to go into several, several of these things. Were these, were these New Testament scholars who who said that Paul originated Christianity? You don't need to name names, but I mean, are they experts? Um, Yes, there's some New Testament scholars that would say, I guess you'd say what we consider Christianity. Yeah, that Paul yeah. was the founder of Christianity. Okay, yeah, there, that, that's been that's been a line that was around. It used to be a very common line. Uh, I think it's less common now uh, because most people recognize what you say, which is that Paul himself uh, heard about Christianity before he became a Christian, <laughs> and so uh, whether or not he was persecuting people, it, it's almost. Um, I think he certainly was persecuting people, but um, I think that. Um, I think the problem is that if you look at Paul's chronology, um, if you look at, uh, like when Paul writes his letters, he sometimes say, you know, three years later I did this. And then, you know, you know, 15 years later I did that. You know, you, you get these chronological designations. And what, what historians do is they, they take these chronological things and they take the letters and they take the book of Acts. They kind of they put it all together. It's a complicated process. People spend years doing this. But when you do all this stuff, when you crank it all out, it looks like Jesus converted to be a follower of Jesus about three or four years after the crucifixion. <laughs> um, and so, you mean Paul, you said Jesus converted to become a Christian. Oh, well, you know, uh, right. <laughs> we'll call that an orthodox corruption. <laughs> that's, a, that's a corruption of the text, only as a correct. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. No, G- Jesus never did convert. <laughs> Paul, <laughs> Paul converted three or four years after, um, after the resurrection. Uh, and so uh, to say that he originated Christianity would mean that there was no Christianity. There was nobody who believed in Jesus before during those first three or four years. And that, that strikes me as completely implausible, um, uh, especially because he himself talks about having arguments with those who were apostles before him. <laughs> well, what, what were the apostles of exactly? And so I think it's implausible to say he started the whole thing. It, it would be fair to say that he... Um, He promoted Christianity more than anyone else that we know of in the period. He developed the theological ideas of Christianity more than anyone else we know of in the period. Um, He, uh, historically, he's far more important than anyone else in the period except for Jesus. That doesn't mean that he's the originator uh, of Christianity, though. Um, It means it means something else. I mean, you know, Dar- Darwin was not the first who came up with the idea of evolution, <laughs> but, you know, we talk about him as if he was, but of course he had predecessors who were starting to lean this way and he, he had special ideas of his own. Paul had special ideas of his own. Um, and when you quote Galatians one, this is really key because almost everybody misunderstands that verse. <laughs> <laughs> so so um, Paul says two things uh, in two different places that uh, that have to be combined to understand his situation. In 1 Corinthians 15, as you pointed out, 
He says that he learned from others that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures and was raised from the dead according to the scriptures. And then he was seen by Cephas and the 12, etc. So Paul says he's learned this from other people. In Galatians, he says that his gospel was given by revelation and not from any human. Those two things sound like they're at odds with each other, but they're not at all at odds with each other because he's not talking about the same thing. In 1 Corinthians 15, he's not talking about his version of the gospel. He's talking about the understanding of Christianity that every follower of Jesus had, that Jesus died and was raised from the dead. His gospel in Galatians is quite clear. If you read, just read Galatians 1 and 2 very carefully. His gospel is his particular understanding of the death and resurrection of Jesus, which says that Gentiles don't have to become Jews in order to be followers of Jesus. So, so Matt, if, if I may, just to interject here, to spru splice this up a little more into detail, is that death, burial, resurrection was probably already an established belief or, or understood uh, thing within the Christ movement or the Jesus movement. Paul is not the originator of that. What Paul seems to be the uh, the pioneer on is, oh my goodness, I'm on a mission to the Goyim, to the Gentiles, to the ethne and the nations, and this is my gospel. That they do not need to be, they do not convert to Jew to become a Jew in order to have salvation. Yes, I think that's absolutely the right. I think that's right. I don't. I don't think there can be much debate about that, really. I mean, I, I mean, I think yes, <laughs> yes. Let me ask you a tough <laughs> one. There's a sure. debate about it, but there's debate about everything. <laughs> but I mean, yeah, no, that's, that's, yeah. I, I'm sure this is a nut you're going to try and crack when you do the uh, the course. But how do we really know what Jesus taught? Right? I mean, you get this all the time, and I know that, that you've written several books. You're going to go into this in your course. Can we honestly trust looking at these gospels? You know. I'm with you on the text critical and looking at this as, as a skeptical kind of what Jesus really said. Did he really talk about his death burial and his resurrection or is this ad hoc or something added, you know, to him after his death by the authors in several places? It seems to give that nod that the author is putting into Jesus mouth or some of his parables sound like something the, the temples already destroyed and they're writing some type of parable, which makes sense of that kind of criteria. How do we know that this is what Jesus taught? Yeah, well, it is a very complicated question, a long question, and I, and I, it's a subject of several of my books. And so um, I won't give you the book length answer here. <laughs> You'll be glad to know. <laughs> um, the basic answer is that you treat the Gospels like you treat any other historical source. Many, um, many people object to that. Conservative Christians think you cannot treat them like any other source because they're inspired by God. But historians understand that inspired by God is a, is a theological claim, and historians don't base their analysis on one theology or another. They don't base it on a theological claim. So uh, the conservative Christians object to it, but also people on the, on the, on the far left object to it as well, because they say, look, the, the Gospels are in the Bible. You can't, you can't trust the Bible sources because I mean, they're just, they're, they're, you know, they're not historical sources. They're biblical sources. They're theological books. Um, my response, and I think both groups are completely wrong. Um, it is true that Matthew is in the New Testament. Matthew, though, did not think he was writing the scriptures of the New Testament. <laughs> Matthew was writing a book about Jesus based on stories he heard. Yes, he believed in Jesus, uh, uh, but he still was recording events that he heard about. That's what a historical source is. Unless he's making up everything whole cloth, then he's basing it on stories that were in circulation. That's true of Mark, Luke, and John as well. Um, and so since they're basing it on stories that have been circulating, these are historical sources that are treated like other sources that contain hearsay, that contain inaccuracies, that contain contradictions, that contain implausibilities. We have lots of ancient sources like that. We don't discount them as historical sources. We don't say, well, you can't trust anything then. When I mean, you can say that, but you could say that about any, you know, if you, if you have a, um, suppose you have a soldier 
uh, from the Second World War. Um, suppose you have two soldiers. Suppose you have a German soldier and an American soldier from the Second World War that are both describing the Battle of the Bulge. Um, and let's say these soldiers weren't actually in the Battle of the Bulge, but they heard them from buddies. Okay. Uh, so if you're trying to reconstruct what happened at the Battle of the Bulge, do you ignore sources like that? Oh, yeah, but, you know, the German has his German view, and he thinks, you know, the American has the American view. So, like, you can't use them because they're biased. Of course not. You look at what they have to say. You compare them to one another. You, you can look at plaus plausibilities, and you do a historical analysis that's based on, do you have independent attestation of events? Is it is something clearly expressing the bias of one party or another? Is another, you know, I mean... You, these are the kinds of things you look at when, when you're doing the Second World War, the historical Jesus. And so you can't just throw out the Gospels because they're in the Bible because the authors didn't know they were writing the Bible. They were just writing stories of Jesus they heard. Before we move forward on this, it's really interesting. Is What if one views the Gospels, the Gospel genre, not in historiography at all? What if, what if they're looking at them in a more mythic, um, some mythic category or something that maybe looks similar. Matthew and Luke kind of has a biographical look to it, cradle to grave, but Mark and John don't. So what if, what if we're looking at the genre and it's not, you know, we're not looking at it as historiography. Can we then approach this and be, wouldn't that cause people to be more skeptical, I guess, on what we're reading as, as factual. And in that question, I guess, is like, you're taking the oral tradition kind of route that there's like, stories and oral things that are coming into the gospels there are other scholars i'm sure you're aware that try to go well we don't we don't think that we should take the oral um the oral tradition route into what we're reading in the gospels they take more of a literary approach or something else what are your thoughts about that well those are two very big questions um and i'd say they're they're questions that are different from each other the first has to do with the genre of the gospels and, you know, if you want to go kind of like, I think you said the mythical route. Right. Uh, so I don't think what you do is you kind of choose something, you know, you pick something out of the air. I think you do, what you do is you read a lot of ancient literature and you try to see um, how literature works. So you have all sorts of different kinds of writings from the ancient world. You've got philosophers, you've got historians, you've got biographers, you got people writing religious texts. You got people writing myths. You've got people, you know, you've got, uh, I mean, you got, you got hundreds of different kinds of writings. And so, um, what you do is you read, you read massively, and you try to figure out, well, how does this kind of, uh, how does this kind of group of writings work together? Like, you have groups that are trying to do historiography. Like, suppose you've got histories of Rome. Okay, so how do they work? You know, their history. And so they're similar because they have this characteristic, this kind of, this, these are the characteristics. They have, they have lots of things different from each other, but they have these characteristics that hold them together as a genre of literature. And you have these other things. You've got these, you've got these myths and this is how they work. Boom, 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 boom. And, and you've got poetry, you know, you've got epic poetry. This is what epic poetry looks like. And so this is what you do with modern literature. Of course, you've got short stories, you've got limerick poems, you've got biographies, you got histories, you got sports page articles, you got things, and like all of these genres have things in common with each other. But the only way to know it is to read a bunch of them to see what the things in common are. And then if you find it, if you pick up a book, suppose you pick up a book and it doesn't have a cover on it, but you're reading this thing, you're trying to figure out what this thing is. Well, you look at what's written in it and you decide, is this a biography? Is this a science fiction novel? Is this a collection of poems? Right? Because you know what the genres are, okay? So when you approach the Gospels, that's what you do. You've, got, you've read widely in Greek and Roman literature, and you ask, what is this like? Is it like myths? Is it like, uh, Rome, like histories of Rome? Is it, um, you know, is it epics? Is it, what, what is it like? And so scholars who do that for a long time now have said, look, basically these are biographies. You know, there are a lot of biographies that do not begin with the birth of a person. Uh, biographies can begin in mid-story if they want to. Um, and so uh, a bio so there are certain generic features to biographies uh, that, um, that biographers talk about, Plutarch, Suetonius, etc. We have, we have biographies, and they're pretty darn similar to the Gospels. The Gospels are different, 
but they're not a, they're not sui generis. They're not like their own thing. They're very much like biographies, especially biographies of religious people. Um, you know, they 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 are far more like um, uh, the, the biography of Apollonius of Tiana than they're like um, like Hesiod's myths about Zeus. You know, so so it's I, I think I think they are they are biography. Um, mo most biographies, uh, biographers are basing their work on uh, stories that they've heard, sometimes written sources, sometimes stories. But Plutarch, for example, will talk about what he's heard about this person or that, this person. He's heard this story. He's heard that story. These are the different versions that he's heard, and he reports them because he, he's heard them. In the ancient world, almost everything, uh, all, all traditions were passed along orally because most people were illiterate. Um, my view is that if um, Christianity is spreading throughout the Roman Empire, uh, as it had to do, as it had to do, it started out in Jerusalem. By the end of the first century, there were Christian communities that were scattered throughout Judea and up in Samaria, up into Syria, over into what's now Turkey, Asia Minor, um, uh, over in Italy, uh, down in North Africa, possibly in Alexandria, possibly as far away as Spain. I mean, they, there are Christian communities in all these places. Most of the people converting are illiterate. So how are people converting people to believe in Jesus? Word of mouth. How could you not have oral traditions? I mean, what? And, and you have some you have some independent sources that tell very similar stories about Jesus. So they can't all be making it up because they they're all similar stories. I'm so, not in. Oh, by the way, just to add the, this caveat, I don't deny oral sources were definitely working. I guess my problem is, is what do we know is really an oral source that goes back to, you know, I, I don't think there's a way to falsify it in my mind. And that's the difficult trouble I have is like, uh, when I interviewed Del Allison Jr., he's huge on the oral source. I, I did a history or not series with him and said, what is what do you think didn't happen historically uh taking a reverse role from the gospels kind of butting against apologetics that are out there and he goes well you know i i said what do you think about the, the jesus being tempted in the wilderness in the gospel of matthew and he's like well if there's a memory he kept using the term memory like there's a memory behind some of this literature he thinks it means that he was just uh, someone who probably was you know casting out demons and so he took the story to be a memory an oral memory maybe that goes back to jesus is casting out demons as some miracle worker and i don't say that's not i can't say that's not true i just don't think that for that case right that there's a good way to even prove that that's the case and so i'm wondering using the oral approach how far back can we really be confident that something really does go back uh to jesus do you see what i'm saying yeah, I do. I mean, there are two questions that I think you're asking. One is, how do you know it goes back to an oral tradition at all? Right. Uh, you know, why don't you just say, say these gospel writers are uh, elite literary people who are coming up with their stories? And so that's one question. Another question is, if if in fact there are oral traditions behind these accounts, which I think there, ha there have to be. <laughs> we could talk about that for a long time. But I'm not in but, denial, by the way. But yeah. No, I, I'm just saying, I know that some people are doubting that, but I... I think there have to be. If there are oral traditions, and how do you establish whether they are historical or not? That that has been the the question that has driven a lot of historical Jesus scholarship for over a hundred years now. And the um, so I'll say several things about it. One thing about Dale Allison's view about this is a memory. Um, I think what Dale, I mean Dale, Dale knows everything, so he knows this. But I mean, there there are a lot of false memories, and so the fact you call it a memory doesn't mean that it has a historical root. Um, people remember, I remember all sorts of things about my past that did not happen at all. And it's not, <laughs> and it's not that they, it's not like I, I mistook them in detail and kind of blew it up or exaggerated it and created a story out of a, a historical kernel. You don't have to have a historical kernel to have a rumor with no basis whatsoever. Uh, and so, um, so I'll say that, so yes, it could be a memory, but it could be a false memory. Um, and so my book, so my, my most, my, my, the book that I think is the most important book I ever wrote that nobody read is about memory uh, and about memory studies 
and about how oral traditions work and how that relates to the historical Jesus. And my book isn't based on like what New Testament scholars say about oral tradition. It's based on what actual experts say about oral tradition, <laughs> like nice. anthropologists. Anthropologists, and so if you want to know about uh, oral tradition, what you do is you you study social anthropologists. I spent years doing this, uh, reading social anthropologists, uh, as well as psych psychologists who are doing psychological analysis of memory. Uh, when you do that kind of work, then you start to understand better how you get how you understand how oral tradition develops, and then the trick is you've got to try to figure out how to put it back into the past, hmm. but. But there are criteria that people use in order to know whether a story uh, in the Gospels goes back to Jesus or not. And it's but it's not ever, almost never, it's almost never going to be a slam dunk case. It's going to be that's more probable than this. In right. my from my view, Dale's view that this is about Jesus casting out demons or something is I, I don't I don't find that plausible. I don't know what the evidence is for it. Um, but I do know of, you know, I can think of really good evidence for it just being a, a, a rumor about Jesus that started. I want to just up front, let's just say, okay, um, what we're reading in the Gospels, apart from some spots where we might think the author's putting in either Pauline theology or this death, burial, resurrection, what post happened to Jesus. Um, let's, let's ignore the stuff that you as a scholar and historian would say, Hey, I don't think Jesus said that or did that. Um, what do you think opposes Paul's teachings? And what does Paul say that you think opposes what you think Jesus actually said? Are there some teasers you can give us? Cause I know your course is going to go into this, but are there any things you can tease us with to just say, I think Jesus probably said this, which would be a different thing than what Paul said here. And Paul says this, and and they're in opposition. Yeah, well, lots of lots of things. And so, once again, it's important to differentiate between a contrast between Paul and one of the Gospels, and a contrast between Paul and the historical Jesus. Those are two separate issues. Right. Just to, to explain that for a second before I get to your question, you know, I think you can show that Paul and Matthew had very different understandings of the Jewish law, for example. Um, so uh, you can you can argue that, of course, but if you if you come to think that that's right, that you got this verse in Matthew that says the followers of Jesus have to keep the law better than the scribes and the Pharisees, um, Matthew five. Uh, verses 17 through 20, and that know that you've got to follow the law better than the scribes and the Pharisees, or you know, you're not going to get into the kingdom of heaven. If you contrast that with Paul, who says that no one is made right with God by following the law, and that Gentiles don't have to follow the law, that kind of seems like their thoughts. <laughs> and so, so you could work that out. But that would be a contrast between Matthew and Paul. The question, so that's one set of questions. That's a very, very, very important set of questions. Another important set of questions is the one that I deal with in my course, which is what can you establish about what Jesus really himself actually said and what Paul actually said, and are they at odds? And so this is where, uh, of course, you, you, you know, at all these things, you're dealing with probabilities, but you know, if you don't deal with probabilities, you don't deal with history. <laughs> you know, you can just say, well, I don't know anything happened in the past. And then you, and then basically you're screwed. Um, if you don't think you can know anything about the past, you're not just screwed. Our, our culture is screwed. If you say that there wasn't a Holocaust, I'm sorry, but, you know, we're screwed. Or if you say that um, this, this, um, this presidential candidate was completely telling the truth when you know that he was lying, we're screwed. So I think it's important to be able to know what the truth is. I think the truth really matters. And the only way to know historical truth is through probabilities. Uh, and so, um, so I think it's, I think it is really probable that both Jesus and Paul were, ap were apocalyptic Jews who thought that the end of the age was coming soon and that God was going to intervene in history and he's going to wipe out everything that was opposed to him. And he's going to bring in a, he's going to bring a utopian kingdom here on earth. Jesus taught that the way to enter into that kingdom was by keeping God's commandments. Uh, to return to God, you're not obeying God, 
You need to return to God. You need to repent. And you need to, to completely commit yourself to God. And you need to start loving your neighbors yourself, helping those in need, taking care of the poor, the hungry, the homeless. You do those things and you will enter into the kingdom. Um, I think you can show that's highly probable what Jesus taught. And it absolutely is not what Paul taught. Paul taught that um, helping others uh, is a good thing, and you should do that. But you are not capable of being good enough to satisfy God because you are, you are controlled by a power of sin that forces you into alienation from God. And the only way to conquer sin is by believing in the death and resurrection of Jesus and being baptized. You do that, and then you can enter into the coming kingdom. Well, is that the thing? <laughs> and so, like, one way to put this is, if Jesus was right, that you could turn your life around and start following the commandments and then enter into the kingdom, if, if Jesus was right about that, then why did he have to die? You could just turn your life around. Paul said he had to die. The death and resurrection is what matters. And if Jesus is right, that, you know, Jesus' teaching, the Sermon on the Mount, for example, is just filled with wonderful ethical teachings about how to live. Paul doesn't mention them. I mean, for him, he says that, not, he said, the only, to Corinthians, he says, the only thing I knew among you was Christ and him crucified. That's the only thing that matters. It's not the only thing that matters to Jesus. He wants you to behave. Paul wants you to behave too, but he thinks you'll behave only when you, when you believe in it or baptized. Wow. So I would say those are different. <laughs> There's so much there. I, I, I know I could go on and on about this. It makes me think of questions of once Jesus died, what went through the minds, what transition took place in the yeah. immediate followers, who concocted or kind of invented in a way uh, yeah. the the kind of rituals we have from the the Lord's Supper to the baptism. The, these yeah. are really curious, interesting questions that I think yeah. – Maybe some of it's picked up from the Greco-Roman world. I mean, there seems to be common ritualistic things. I look at John Kloppenborg and his yeah. Christ Associations book, which is really yeah. interesting, you know, yeah. taking a heuristic approach. But I love what you're saying here. It really makes you want to get back to Jesus to know more about this guy and even cool. understanding Paul, right? So well, your course wrong. is going to And, you know, and so this course that I've done is, is kind of scratching the surface for both of them in order to show that the – I don't argue that they're contradictory or anything like that. People could draw that conclusion, mm -hmm. but uh, yeah, you know, is there continuity? Are they completely at odds? Are they similar? They, I mean, how, how does all that work? And then, boy, yeah, you're right. You know, you have these big issues about where do the Christian rituals come from? You know, baptism, probably not from the Greco-Roman world, but the Eucharist, probably from, you know, meals. And so, yeah, that um, Christian history is a really, it's a really interesting thing. So, but this, this to me, Jesus and Paul is like one of the fundamental issues, the basic things. Is Christianity what Jesus preached or not? And if Paul's, if Paul's preaching, if Paul's preaching is right, then how could Jesus preaching be right? Whoa. <laughs> okay, then. Wow. So just so everybody knows what they will get here, you can go, you'll own it for life. Eight lectures, Paul and Jesus, the great divide. Did Paul and Jesus have the same religion? Be sure to sign up. Lots of questions gets answered. In fact, I know for a fact, we didn't even touch the top of the tip of the iceberg. There's a lot in this course you'll get access to. And uh, Bart, I look forward to seeing you there, my friend. Bart D. Airman, thank you for joining me again. Does it sound weird when I put your middle initial uh, addressing you? No, <laughs> it is my <laughs> middle initial. <laughs> I just it just sounds funny because I write it that way, but it's like Bart D. Airman. Um, so Jesus is coming back next Thursday or Friday. I can't remember which day it is. Correct? Well, you'll know when it happens. <laughs> You have an upcoming webinar. I hope everybody takes the time to go and sign up. It's not costly, and it's going to be informative on a topic that's dear to my heart. One of the last standing places I was within Christianity was eschatology, mm. and it was Jesus said some things, or at least the Gospels say that Jesus said some things. 
and the book of Revelation, which you recently published a book on. So um, can you tell us briefly about what this webinar is going to be about? So the uh, the webinar is, is devoted to the issue of the rapture. Uh, the rapture is this uh, idea that you find in fundamentalist and conservative evangelical circles that says that Jesus is coming back probably soon to uh, to take his followers out of the world. The followers of Jesus will be raptured. They'll be snatched up, which is what rapture means. They'll be snatched up and taken to heaven. Uh, so that they don't have to experience the next seven years. The next seven years will be a period of tribulation on the earth, horrible suffering. The Antichrist will rise up. There'll be military issues, wars everywhere, natural catastrophes, uh, until after seven years, even God gets fed up and intervenes and destroys the whole lot of them. Um, who have, who have not sided with them, but the, the fathers of Jesus seven years earlier, have taken out so they, they don't have to be here for it. My, my lecture is on, uh, on, the, on the rapture and where this idea came from because everybody simply assumes that it's in the Bible and probably comes from the book of Revelation. And in fact, it does not. It doesn't come from the book of Revelation. And in fact, it's never in the Bible. Uh, that seems counterintuitive to people because they've heard verses from the Bible that sure sound like the rapture to them. And I'll be trying to show why these verses, in fact, are not talking about what they say they're talking about. And it's actually not that hard to prove, <laughs> uh, but people don't see it and have never been told this before. You have gone on record saying Jesus failed as an apocalyptic figure. Am I right? No, I don't think I've said he's failed, but I have said he was wrong. <laughs> okay, so I don't so, like to think of Jesus as a failure, but it, it is. It, Jesus thought that the end was coming in in his own generation. He he, like other apocalypticists, he thought the end was coming in his generation, and no, he was wrong about that. It, it did not happen then. So, if we take your uh, particularly, it's not just yours; it's a scholarly assessment that Jesus expected the son of man, which was not him to come soon and the kingdom of God, which was going to be a real physical, actual kingdom of God on earth, um, which seems to be depicted in some way revelation, this millenarian figure named John on the island of Patmos seems to have also this idea that God's actual kingdom is going to come to earth. Um, whether we interpret it that way or through the lens that, well, the Jesus is the one who's going to come and he's the son of man. Both of those fell. No matter what path you take, it fails. Unless you're a Gnostic who imagines this in some esoteric spiritual way. But then again, nothing actually happened, right? Um, the book of Revelation does think it's going to happen soon and that it, it did not happen. But there have been, uh, you know, for the course of most of Christian history, biblical scholars and theologians have insisted that Revelation was not predicting that. Uh, it's not that they were Gnostics. They, they weren't Gnostics. But uh, going back to St. Augustine in the fifth century, St. Augustine argued that when the uh, book of Revelation describes the future millennium on earth, where there be a thousand year reign of Christ here on earth, that he was actually talking about what was going to happen when the church took over the Roman world, that the church would reign on earth, that Christ would rule through the church. And in during the millennium in the book of Revelation, Satan is bound and is unable to, to harm anybody. And according to uh, Augustine, Satan cannot hurt anybody in the church because they have the power of God behind them. And so Satan is bound for anyone who believes. Uh, and so they, the, the interpretation of Revelation that lasts over century after century after century until modern, relatively modern times was not that it's predicting the, the future. John himself thought he was predicting the future, but not in the way fundamentalists think, but he, he did think this was going to happen soon. And so he, he did fail at that. Uh, he was wrong about that too. But it's not that Christians have always thought that. Christians typically have thought uh, that, the, that it's happening now. The millennium is now. There's so much thought on this. And of course, I'm sure you're going to cover a lot of this in the webinar. I recently interviewed Robert J. Miles and James Crossley on the book, Jesus, A Life in Class Conflict. And we were talking about Revelation in passing and this millenarian idea. I'm throwing out a few names. You know all of these people. Uh, Dr. John Dominic Crossan, uh, he, his approach. And ultimately, 
what we walked away and I'd love to get your thoughts on the book of revelation being written by this guy named John, who is a millenarian. He thinks that it's going to happen soon. Uh, apocalyptic wise that God's going to come bring re revenge and judgment. But they think that there's some of that. There's still this like continuity to Jesus as a figure in a similar vein. I know that John's writing this later at the end of the first century, but that in that same vein, there's some, connection um do you think that while there's big differences do you think there's some connection because you've mentioned in the past that jesus's teachings were more love the poor and help the poor and stuff and i know john's not mentioning that i think he might be traumatized by what happened in 70 but do you think that behind the message of jesus it's like well god's gonna come and make the least the first and or the the last first and the ones on the bottom on top which means he is still going to destroy and kick the butt of those who are rich, who are, you know, being the way they are toward his people. Um, so there's still a butt kicking coming. It's just not as bloody and wrathful as we see in Revelation. Uh, well, no, that's that's been my that's been my argument about Jesus for as long as I've been a scholar, is that contrary to um, contrary to John Dominic Cross, and he does not think that is what jesus was all about i think jesus was an apocalyptic prophet he thought that the end of the world was coming soon that god was soon to intervene he was going to destroy everything and everybody opposed to him and bring in a kingdom where uh where the those who lived righteously would be would be rewarded uh and so the issue for me with the book of revelation is not whether it has an apocalyptic view i mean obviously a book called the apocalypse is going to have an apocalyptic <laughs> view and in the apocalypse jesus had an apocalyptic view so they have they have apocalyptic views but the way they work out their apocalyptic views are radically different from each other um in jesus apocalyptic view for one thing um when god destroys his enemies he's not going to torture them uh he destroys them in the book of revelation god destroy destroys people after torturing them um and so that's you know i don't think jesus thought that at all there's nowhere in the gospels there's no he when he jesus talks about the destruction that's coming it's an annihilation um and john in the book of revelation makes clear that it's not an annihilation at one point one of the catastrophes that hits the earth is that these um these locusts come out of a pit that spread all over the earth and they have the power to inflict pain they sting everybody except for the followers of jesus they sting everybody and these people are in excruciating pain for five months and are not allowed to die and so there's nothing they can do about it and that's one of the punishments that god sends the christ sends in the book of revelation and you know that is just not jesus of the gospels uh, Jesus of the Gospels doesn't, he's not into the torture and into the prolonged agony. And, and so, um, so there's that difference. And the other difference is that, G, that the book of Revelation maintains that there's only a tiny slice of people that are going to survive this coming onslaught. It's not even all Christians. There are a lot of Christians who are going to be wiped out with everyone else and thrown into a, a live. They'll be thrown alive into a lake of burning sulfur. That's how they're going to be destroyed. And but a lot of including a lot of Christians. And it depends precisely that you believe precisely the right things about Jesus. And you do precisely the right things about Jesus, which are the things that John himself believes and does. You do those things, you'll survive. Otherwise, it's off to the lake of fire. And that's not at all what Jesus taught. Jesus taught that, in fact, what matters before God is that you help those who are in need. Uh, those who are poor, those who are hungry, those who are homeless, you take care of them and God will welcome you into his kingdom. You don't, then you're going to be fried. It's almost like John is obsessed with the idea of just separating yourself from the from Rome, really, in the participation in Rome. That is the achievement of not getting destroyed. He's so obsessed and angry, and this is me reading into it, but I imagine PTSD or some hatred toward what they did to the Jews in 70. Um, and Elaine Pagels wrote about this in her book on Revelation, kind of wanted to get your comments on where, you know, here's Rome, a male in this figurine. There's some gender studies that can be done on this, where there's a rape act on each nation with a blade to the, to the throat of, of the woman, which represented the Jews. 
Um, and so here's this man saying, God, how long? No, you're going to come in and I know what's going to happen. So the message isn't so much of like a conflict of treating poor people or people who are hungry or things like that. It's more like segregate or separate, separate yourself from what Rome is doing and that Rome is the bad guy in the whole picture. Is that correct? Uh, yeah, well, I agree. I agree that Rome is the problem for the book of Revelation. I think it's quite clear. Uh, one of the things I do in my book on Armageddon is try to show how we know that because for anybody who knows what to look for, historical scholars, this is just commonplace. When he talks about the beast from the sea that is referred to by many people call it call him the Antichrist. The term Antichrist does not appear in the book of Revelation, but this is the figure they call the Antichrist figure. It's quite clear this is this is the Roman emperor and uh, and the enemy is the city of Rome. Uh, the the whore of Babylon in chapter uh, in in chapter thir in chapter 17, the whore of Babylon is Rome. And that can be that can be demonstrated from the text itself. Uh, 666 is a reference to the Roman Emperor Nero. This can be shown from the text itself. And so I do that, all that in my book. The one thing I disagree with, um, is that I don't, I don't think that the destru that the, I don't know that this author was Jewish. Um, I don't know that he was Jewish. And I don't, I don't know that the destruction of the temple per se is, that is caused him a lot of anxiety. Um, he he clearly he he clearly thinks Rome is the problem, but it's not the Roman treatment of Jews that's the problem. It's tr Roman treatment of Christians, um, uh, who whether they're Jewish or not. Uh, and so that's in in this book it presupposes that the vast majority of the followers of Jesus are non-Jewish. Uh, mm -hmm. And so I don't know whether he was Jewish or not, frankly. But but de definitely Rome uh, is the enemy. Now, what do we do with Paul, right? We talk about Paul in some ways. You see it contradict Jesus, of course, in his letters versus what we find in the Gospels. But Paul's view of what is the parousia, um, you also find this language in Revelation of this kind of parousia, the coming of the Lord. And it seems like this author is aware of the Sibylline oracles, at least uh, I've seen Nero Redivivus play its role in, in some of the sibling oracles as we see it in Revelation. So I'm kind of wondering, what does Paul contradict this guy, John? I mean, Elaine Pagels, I think, tried to make a point that she even thought maybe there's a jab at Paul in like the second angel to the church where there's this idea of like meat sacrificed to idols. And uh, anyway, like, I don't know where you fall on some of these details, but what are your thoughts about John and, and Paul? Do they contradict in their views of the end? Uh, they're broadly very similar that there's uh, Jesus is coming back to destroy his enemies and will bring in a kingdom. So they're, they're broadly similar uh, in many ways. Um, I disagree with Elaine on this point. Uh, I don't think that Paul is the target. Of the book of revelation um i think there's very slim evidence for that they uh the one point where they do overlap uh they all overlap in a number of points but the one point has to do with food offered to idols whether it's appropriate to eat it or not paul talked about this in first corinthians chapters 8 and 10 and he thinks that um he thinks basically you know you should not eat the meat um, he talks about the pluses and minuses basically and says, yeah, but you know, in the end, don't do it. John has a very decided view that anyone who is a follower of Jesus who eats uh, meat that has been previously offered to an idol has committed uh, a sin that will be punished horribly. Uh, God will destroy this person. Uh, his most vivid image of this is in uh, his discussion. It's not of a Paul figure. It's a woman. Uh, it's a woman prophetess in the city of Thyatira. That um, so it's a woman, and uh, she's active in a particular church that Paul has never been associated with, Thyatira. And John calls her Jezebel. Jezebel is the name of a wicked queen who uh, really was bad news for Israel in the Old Testament. And this woman is bad news for the Christians, according to John, because um, she thinks it's okay, John says, to eat the meat, as did some people in Corinth uh, when P Paul was writing them. It's okay to eat the meat. Um, and the the background of this, if you don't mind, I take a second on this because it's a really important sure. passage. I love it. Um, the background of this is that um, in the ancient world, 
you didn't have butchers who were just kind of set it, setting up shop. Most people didn't eat meat a lot because it was expensive. But if you did eat meat, usually, almost always, it was meat that had been sacrificed in the temple. Um, you, you've got a family party or you got a block party or something, you got a neighbor party, you got a city party and you, you go to the temple and, and you're going to have some meat and you sacrifice the animal to, to one of the gods and the meat, then the priests slaughter the animal and they butcher it and they skin it and they, they burn the skin and the bones and the fat to the gods or to the God. And then the meat gets, you know, taken for the people to eat and whatever is left over the, the priests sell. And so if you're going to eat meat in the ancient world, you're buying temple meat. And so Christians wondered, is that okay? Because like it's been offered to a God. And some are saying, uh, is it, we get more of this in Corinth, but in first Corinthians, but some are saying, well, um, yeah, that's okay to eat. Look, these gods don't exist. <laughs> You're not really sacrificing to a god. If there's no god there, <laughs> you can't you can't eat meat offered to a god if there's no god. <laughs> and so it's okay. They're just like they're mistaken about this. And other people say, no, 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 no. This is participating in pagan worship. You can't do it. And Paul weighs in and says, yeah, okay, don't do it. <laughs> but John weighs in and says, oh my God, if you do this. So Jezebel is saying it's okay to do. We don't know what she was saying. You know, to put a good read on it, she might be saying, look, your neighbors invite you over for a meal and they're not Christian. You're Christian. Go to the meal, eat their meal. They serve you meat, eat the meat. It'll give you a chance to talk to them about Jesus. You can spread the word. Maybe they'll get more interested. You can invite them to the church. And, you know, she may be saying something like that. But John thinks that she's the spawn of Satan for allowing people to eat meat offered to idols. And he said, this is in one of the letters that Christ dictates to John that he sends to this church in Thyatira, where Christ says that this Jezebel has uh, urged people to worship idols and to commit fornication uh, in Jewish thinking and then Christian thinking after it. Uh, idolatry was always con connected with sexual sins for some reason. Um, so uh, he says that Jezebel is doing this, and Christ says, in Revelation chapter 2, that I will take Jezebel and I will throw her on a bed. Okay, so now some translations say hospital bed or sick bed. No, the word is bed and she doesn't get sick <laughs> as in a hospital. Men come and have sex with her. Christ has thrown her in a bed. Men come and have sex with her. We're not told if they are raping her or if she's willing to have sex with them. But um, Christ says he's going to plague these men and he's going to kill her babies. Christ is going to kill her babies. This is Revelation chapter 2, verse 22. Um, so that's a, that the outcome is very similar to Paul's, don't eat the meat, but the view of it is really quite drastically different. <laughs> I want people to let that sink in for a second. It's a horrible That's, scene. This is Christ. Is, this is Christ. And so this is my part of my, my view of my book on Armageddon is that the view of revelation, the, the understanding of Jesus in revelation is not the understanding of Jesus in the gospels. And I don't think the view of this author, John of Patmos, I don't think his understanding of Christ is Jesus own understanding of, of himself or, or of his gospel. And then there's a mention of Satan's throne too. I don't know if you've done any background knowledge on that. What what the heck is that about? In one of these letters that um, that Christ dictates through John to the seven churches of Asia Minor, he speaks of a church where uh, w that are being opposed by uh, the synagogue, which is the, the throne of Satan. And so there, the Christians, the the Jew, the, the synagogue, the Jewish community, is understood to be empowered by Satan. Um, okay. That's not very wow. ecumenical. <laughs> yeah. yeah. This fits why you were saying, maybe we don't even know what this author, like where, if they're Jewish or not, and it might fit within the trope of what we see happening later at the end of the first century, start of the second with this anti-Jewish or anti-Judaism, I'll say, yeah. rhetoric. People, people have people use crazy arguments to argue this guy's a Jew, and he may be a Jew. John, John was did was a Jewish name, 
Uh, but he's living at the end of the, in the nineties. You know, Peter was a Christ, was a, wasn't a Christian name until Peter came along and then till Jesus renamed Peter. Then people started calling their kids Peter. So I don't know if this is a Christian who's named this person, their child, John after one of the famous Johns or, or whether, I don't know. He's not, he's not called John, John the son of Zebedee. But people use crazy arguments to say, well, he's got to be Jewish. You know, he quotes the Old Testament a lot. You know, he refers to the Old Testament. He loses, so he's got to be Jewish, right? Who else would know the Old Testament? And you think, what are you talking about? I mean, what? I mean, have you read anything? <laughs> These scholars mm -hmm. say this. I mean, First Clement was written just about the same time. First Clement is written by a Gentile. And the whole thing is about the Old Testament. The idea that only Jews knew the Old Testament, I mean, Christians, people who became Christians, who converted, or people who grew up in Christian families by the end of the first century, of course they knew the Old Testament. They quote it. And so when Paul writes 1 Corinthians, he's writing to people that he says were pagans. And he has the most complicated interpretations of the Old Testament, and he expects his readers to know what he's talking about. So it's a silly argument to say that if he quotes the Old Testament, he's got to be Jewish. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I have one more question for you, Dr. Ehrman, and that is all the research you've done over the decades, you know, your scholarship, would you say learning the historical, cultural significance to the context of the material we're reading, the book of Revelation, Paul's letters, the Gospels, whatever it may be, do you think that knowing that historical context played some role in you not believing it literally is true anymore. I mean, uh, another way of phrasing it is, do you think finding out who, what, when, where, how, and why played a role in your deconversion? From Christianity? Yes, sir. Uh, no, I don't. I don't. I, uh, I, I have a lot of uh, Christian friends, with scholar friends, who would agree with everything I've said today, um, who are still Christians. Um, I, um, uh, met up with one of my best friends last night, who's a Presbyterian minister who, uh, who, uh, agrees with everything I would have said just now. Um, and so this kind of information will almost certainly, if you really, if you really look into it and buy into it, it will almost certainly lead you away from being a fundamentalist. <laughs> It will be, uh, and and you know you're going to have trouble staying in the evangelical camp, even as a liberal. Although you could do, but but there are plenty of uh, Christian scholars who are who subscribe who are um, who are experts on Revelation. I mean, I think um, well, famous scholars that you know, if you know anything about the Book of Revelation and you know who's written about it, say in the last twenty years, New Testament scholars, most of them are Christian, almost all of them. Um, I can't think of anybody who's a, not a Christian, actually. So this is not what leads you away from faith. This leads you to an, to an informed faith. It, so if you people who are Christian can still be Christian. Being Christian does not mean you believe in the Bible. <laughs> right. being, being Christian means that you you know you have this idea that there is a divine being in the world, and that that Christ in some way manifests this divine being, so you can understand God better or relate to God better. There are lots of different kinds of Christian. I left Christianity because um, I thought that the that I could no longer accept the idea of a powerful and loving God in charge of this world, given all of the horrible, horrible suffering in it. And I just got to a point, I didn't believe that there's a God who's active in any way at all in this world. So that's why I left Christianity. It had nothing to do with knowing that there was no rapture in the New Testament, <laughs> you know, or that, that the the uh, 666 is Nero, you know, or that the enemy of Revelation is Rome. It's got nothing to do with any of that. That led me away from being a fundamentalist and moved me away from being an evangelical to being a liberal Christian. But liberal Christian scholars agree with a lot, with most of this. So the, the, in that question, sorry, I'm keeping you just a tad bit longer okay. here. Is that you're hitting something important to me. Is like, as a liberal Christian, that meant you probably still accepted that Jesus rose for some reason. I know John Dominic Crossan doesn't. He thinks it's more of an allegory or something. But like, did you, did you as you deconverted, did your perception of the resurrection also change? Because now you're like, okay, God, how could he allow all this evil, this suffering, this wicked stuff that we see around us, like children and cancer and you name it. Oh, the list can go on. Um, did After you came to that conclusion, did you then reevaluate the resurrection or were you already as a liberal Christian? Because I know you had a slow 
transition there, um, start going, well, maybe this isn't, this didn't literally happen, but I still believe in the faith. I mean, where, when did you change your view on the resurrection? Uh, I changed it before I left Christianity. Uh, I believed that the resurrection spoke a very powerful message about how death is not the end of the story. And that uh, it's the same, in some ways, it's the same message of Revelation. I, I think Revelation is a really, um, it's a very, uh, it's, a, it's a problematic book. I mean, there's a lot of evil that happens in Revelation that claims God is doing it. And I don't, I don't believe that. But the basic idea that at the end, good will triumph and that, um, that God, however you define God, God will win. Uh, that basic idea I held on to as a liberal Christian, but I didn't think that the resurrection literally physically happened. I thought it was a metaphor for the fact that good will triumph and that death is not the end of the end of the story. Um, when I stopped being a Christian for these other reasons, because of the issue of theodicy about trying to explain the problem of suffering, when I left Christianity for that reason, then there is no longer even an issue. I mean, you can't, God can't raise Jesus from the dead if there's no God. <laughs> and so that, that one's easy. Uh, but as a Christian still, um, you know, and again, I know a lot of Christian people, um, scholars who don't believe in a literal physical resurrection of Jesus. They just, they don't think that happened. They don't believe in a virgin birth. They don't, you know, that isn't what they think Christianity is all about. Um, many people say, well, you can't be a Christian if you don't believe in the Bible. Well, I deal with that in my book in a footnote, actually. <laughs> I actually am dealing, sorry, now I'm taking your time, but, you no. know, people tend to think that the book of Revelation, um, that it, it, everybody seems to think that it's predicting our future. Fundamentalists think it's predicting, predicting it correctly, and they know when it's going to happen or it's going to happen soon. But even the person on the street, the woman on the street, you ask her what Revelation's about, she says, well, it's predicting our future. Even though she's like, you know, she's Jewish or something. I don't know. She's not, it's like what everybody thinks about the book of Revelation. It's predicting our future. And that, that view is modern. That view, the reason everybody has that view is because fundamentalists won on that point. Fundamentalists convinced everyone that Revelation is talking about our future, even though that was not the view of the church for, you know, 1800 years. And so, but fundamentalists have now convinced everybody that that's what it's about. They're wrong about that. But the other thing they've convinced people about is they've convinced everybody that if you don't believe in the Bible, you can't be a Christian. That is just stupid. I mean, it's not even like bad theology. It's just stupid. I mean, how can you possibly say that you have to believe in the Bible to be a Christian? What about the people who were Christian before there was a Bible? <laughs> you, know, I mean, you don't have our New Testament formulated, kind of finalized until what, the 4th, 5th century? And so like everybody before that wasn't a Christian because they didn't believe in the Bible? <laughs> and you mean, and so, and where does Jesus go around saying that, you know, if you want eternal life, believe in the Bible? <laughs> you don't find that anywhere in the Bible. And look at, look at the Nicene Creed, the, the creed that formed the basis of Christian faith for centuries and centuries. We believe in God Almighty, God, God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. And, you know, it goes on and gives the things you have to believe to be a faithful Christian. It doesn't mention the Bible. And so why do you think believing the Bible is it? Because the fundamentalists told you that. The fundamentalist said, if you don't believe in the Bible, you can't be a Christian. And everybody said, oh, really? Oh, God, I guess I'm not a Christian then because I believe in evolution. Oh, you know, and, but liberal Christians like smart theologians are saying, what are you talking about? <laughs> believing the Bible is not what Christianity is. Christianity is about believing in Jesus. <laughs> it's not, in some way, it's not about believing the Bible. <laughs> and so, but every, anyway, especially here in the South, you know, people just say, well, you know, you can't be a Christian if you don't believe in the Bible. <laughs> so, where are you getting this from? Anyway, sorry, that was my little soapbox. <laughs> I loved it. That was such a good soapbox. You know, Bart, me and you, we know that there's a rapture happening sometime <laughs> soon. So we want people to make sure they sign up for this lecture because if they don't go, yeah. what will happen to them is going to yep. be they'll be left behind. <laughs> yeah. And you know what happens to people who get left behind? Ooh, it's bad. Ooh, 
Very bad. Very, very bad. <laughs> so you don't I, want to be left behind. <laughs> you really don't, Bar. I'm excited about this lecture. I always enjoy learning from you, all of your courses. Of course, they can go to your website and check them out. This one is going to be amazing. It's going to be live. We can go check it out. Um, thank you for giving us your time today and yeah. teaching us a little bit about Revelation. We've got a real deep sneak peek. Get the book. Sign up for the course. Any final words from you? Uh, no, but uh, except, except also go to my blog, the Bart Ehrman blog. I talk about this stuff all the time, five times a week, every blog post going back 10 years, and I raise money doing it for charity. So why not? Thank you, Bart.